good morning everyone we welcome you all to this very interesting seminar by association of medical consultants Prana, please uh, start putting in our videos. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, to a very informative Sunday morning where we are going to know and learn all about cancers. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our honorary secretary, Dr. Heman Dugar. Sir is a, a senior practicing obstetrician and gynecologist since 1985. He is having a multi speciality hospital in Andheri East. He has been honorary secretary of AMC for the year 2022 and 23. Sir was ex-assistant honorary at BMC Cooper Hospital. Sir has been associated with Lions Club International since 1992-1993. Over to you, uh, Dr. Heman Dugar, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manza. The Suprabhatam Suswagatam, the, all the uh, delegates to this uh, wonderful seminar, uh, webinar of uh, today morning. And uh, I know uh, uh, with a uh, winter session uh, setting in, it's basically a time for uh, uh, celebration, enjoy, and when the Christmas around and the new year around, and but still the uh, uh, problem with our president dr nilima vidya bhamre is that uh, uh, you know when uh, uh, nine months of her uh, tenure is getting over uh, she is into that preparation of her delivery and delivering uh, final uh, <laughs> so uh, and in and all three faces what you see is all gynax Manzar is also Gainak, Nilima Vedya, and me too. So, and oh, of course, our PCC, Dr. Rinawani. So, all these gynecologists, when they uh, come together, it's only a matter of uh, delivering, delivering, and delivering. And what we are delivering, we are, uh, 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 we must, uh, you know, appreciate the efforts of uh, President and PCC to uh, decide, implement, and think about you know the various aspects it's not only about uh, 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 you know like uh, uh, somebody is sponsoring and that is why but these are the things uh, which are so very important we just saw last uh, sunday the uh, all about diagnostics so much enthusiasm and so much interest and the same way it is today that uh, we have more than uh, 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 350 plus uh, registration because people want to understand what is uh, going on, what is developing. And cancer is one such thing where everybody is afraid of, the, be it a general population or the medicos, because everybody understands that uh, 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 we are uh, reaching uh, end of the tunnel. So, uh, but it's not so. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, evolutions, research, and the hope uh, being created and that's how the in today's uh, uh, webinar uh, the topics selected are uh, uh, pertaining to all about uh, cancer where it starts from and what are the things which are available including the palliative care and the support system so uh, welcome you all to uh, this fine webinar and uh, I hand it over to uh, our president, Dr. Nilima Vaidya Bhamre, gynecologist and a lawyer. Uh, she has uh, uh, been a secretary for uh, our association, Association of Medical Consultants, for consecutive two years. She is the vice president of Kandivali Medical Association, founder member of Mumbai Dharkan, secretary of being doctors, 
एक्स मेंबर ऑफ मेडिको लीगल कमिटी फॉक्सी बेस्ट स्पीकर अवार्ड एंड लेट मी टेल यू इन माई नाइन मंथ्स ऑफ एसोसिएशन विथ हर दैट शी स्पीक्स शी स्पीक्स एंड शी स्पीक्स एंड शी इज वेरी क्लियर इन हर थॉट प्रोसेस एंड शी सीज टू इट दैट द uh even though i am also a good speaker uh, as far as my lionistic world is concerned but uh, uh, i also don't get much of a chance so uh, this is the uh, president what we have today a versatile uh, bold and uh, go getter dr nilima vaidya bhamre welcome madam please carry it forward himant now here being secretary of amc you have adequate <laughs> opportunity to speak speak and speak all right both of us are speakers and that has actually helped the association because we can converse we can converse we can comment and we can comprehend it is so important you know nowadays we say about communication but more and more we are realizing that comprehension is more important so what i conceive or what i think of hemant implements hemant is such a strong backbone for me this year thank you hemant for being secretary of amc and together we have done wonders uh vikram khanna also i do not want to forget because he has uh, been a backbone where our uh, uh, accounts and all has been concerned and wonderful work being done over there all right now welcome to this uh, webinar uh, for me okay it is extremely difficult to decide upon a topic because we are a multi speciality organization so we cannot cater to particular speciality and we have already have specialty organizations doing the academics for them so what besides medical legal medical legal is our strong point we are doing a lot of work on medical legal front we have already started a medical legal series so we are nowhere neglecting our strengths all right but what i thought was that my year should not go waste in the sense that i believe in preventive medicine i believe in holistic healthcare and who else but our own community who should benefit from this so not only did we do for the community but we did for outside people also throughout the year you've seen that we've taken up a lot of programs regarding blood donations organ donations all about blood all about pathology work all about diagnostics now we come up uh, with all about cancers cancer is one disease which i think can be prevented uh, medical legally speaking also this webinar is going to be very important like we saw in our pathology seminar last week uh, there was so much of eye opening uh, points which were presented by all the speakers and we are taking special care to talk to our speakers and tell them exactly what we want what we lack when we find uh, in our day to day practice in our clinical practice ki kya kami reh gayi hai kya hum nahi jante as doctors kya hum nahi jante because if we don't know we cannot tell our patients so awareness is the main theme doctors need to be aware of whom to refer which patient to refer when and to which specialty is it going to be an onco uh, uh, medic medical oncologist or is it going to be an onco surgeon or is it going to be a regular gynecologist or a regular uh, breast specialist or something like that we need to know where to refer patients when we are stumped when to refer at the right time what diagnostics are involved that also we need to know so our seminar today is going to be all about cancer so fasten your seat belts and we are going to go on the roller coaster ride of all about cancer reena is going to now tell you about our upcoming programs we have a lot of programs coming up but specially i want to mention about the amcon uh, we are having the amcon after 2 years so we have decided to have it as a grand uh, uh, amcon for 2 days 25th and 26th of february so please book block your dates for the amcon again this amcon is going to be slightly hatke so i am hoping that you all enjoy the kind of topics we are going to get for you uh, there is there is going to be a variety in the way we are going to present the amcon to you it uh, it will be maybe through music maybe through sound maybe through dance uh, various topics being taken up in a different way to be presented to you so i hand over to uh, manzar to introduce our pcc and uh, she can tell us about our further programs thank you thank you madam president for that very comprehensive introduction of today's program as well as giving a little insight into what future holds for us uh, thank you madam it gives me immense pleasure pride and honor to introduce our uh, 
PCC, Dr. Reena Vani, Madam has been my teacher and my association goes a long way with Madam. Madam is professor and head of department of obstetric and gynecology department, HBT Medical College and Dr. R. N. Cooper Hospital. She is program committee chairman of AMC. She's been an active member of Foxy GCPR for COVID guidance and vaccination 2020-21. Madam uh, has been president of Mumbai Breastfeeding Promotion Committee between the year 2019 and 22. She's been member actively involved in Foxy MOGS, has been member of core committee of Foxy Violence Against Women's Cell, chairperson of Foxy Perinatology Committee in 2015 and 17. Madam has contributed to many national, international books, chapters, and publications in journals. Madam has been gold medalist throughout her UGPG career. Thank you so much, Madam. Over to you. Thank you so much, Manzar, for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure and privilege to have uh, all of you with us today on Sunday morning, devoting your time for such an important topic. And Manzar is now a, a very uh, good practicing consultant doing a lot of work. And I'm very happy that you are also active in uh, uh, our AMC. Well, you know, it's been said something about the specialists. A specialist is someone who is called in at the last minute to share the blame. And it was also said by Voltaire, doctors are men who, pres who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of they know less in human beings of which they know nothing. But we are not in that situation. But when it comes to cancer, it becomes a situation where people are a little confused. So that's why today's uh, uh, webinar is focused from beginning to end about cancer, but uh, giving you a little glimpse into what we have in the future. We have a whole series of programs focusing on holistic health. We've already been talking about mental and financial health. And uh, uh, our fin FinCon uh, series had kicked off on Gandhi Jayanti. And the next one, friends, is coming up next weekend. Please keep a little time on Christmas because you'll get a gift from Santa Claus if you follow the advice which is given to you by the specialists of FinCon because we are going to be talking about personal finance for doctors and how you can grow your health uh, with your, your health as far as financial health is concerned. We are also having a, a continuation of our uh, medical legal series. Dr. Vidya Shetty is looking into that and Dr. Narendra Dedia is our uh, convener for the FinCon. Uh, along with that, we are also going to have other non-academic initiatives. Like for example, on the 26th of January, is the bikeathon where we are going to have uh, the lady and men bikers whoever are interested please register for it and our president herself is going to be one of the participants uh, you all must have already received a message from ashwin gidwani productions through amc we are having a very special offer of this silent humor comedy of a international prize winning artist called black tape it is coming up on the 29th of jan Please block your tickets well in advance and enjoy this uh, event. Uh, in the first week of uh, February, we are having a Digicon in which we will have our Digi Savvy members. And in fact, if any of you are interested, please write to us at the AMC office if you want to participate and you feel you, you can uh, give it, give in some inputs technologically, uh, followed by the ITCon on the 12th of February. These, this is our tentative plan. Our president has told you about AMCON, but AMCON this time is on the Astitva theme, in which on 25th, we are focusing on fitness of the fraternity. And on 26th, our theme will be Ek Zindagi SEB, where you talk about jo Dr. Kam Hatke Kar Rahe hai, or something different. So friends, uh, we are also going to have a wonderful car rally, International Women's Day on the 8th of March will be celebrated along with other things with a car rally. So all of you get geared for that also. This is just a glimpse into what the future programs hold for you. Thank you very much. And please be with us to the end. A lot of queries had come in the chat box. How do you mark your attendance for the webinar? Definitely stay logged in. Uh, and uh, if you have already paid for the MMC points, don't worry, it will definitely happen as long as you stay logged in to the webinar today. Thank you, Manzar, and over to you.
Thank you, Madam Mani, for giving us a glimpse into all the future details and programs of AMC. Now we begin with our scientific session. Can we have the CV, please? Yeah. So today's opening batsman or the first speaker for the day is Dr. Shitit Joshi. Dr. Shitit Joshi is a medical oncologist at Mumbai Oncare Ville Parle. He's been a consultant medical oncologist director and co-founder of Mumbai Onco Care. He had completed his DM in medical oncology from GCRI, and he has an experience of over nine years in medical oncology and has treated over 50,000 patients so far. Over to you, sir, for giving us a detailed uh, review of screening in cancer. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, thank you very much, everyone associated with Association of Medical Consultant Mumbai. Uh, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Nilima, Madam, Hemant, Sir, and Reena, Madam. Uh, so this is an opportunity for me and Mumbai Onco Care to present our little knowledge that we have uh, about cancer in front of for all our colleagues, senior dignitaries. So let us, without wasting much time, so let us start with the first topic of today, which is screening in cancer. I will try to touch upon a very practical aspect of screening in cancer in a very short presentation. So can I share my screen? Uh, Dr. Shitish, you can share screen from your laptop. Yeah, I will yeah, go ahead. Yeah. try once. The option down of share screen. So just click on that. Okay, just give me a minute. Is it visible? Yes, now? please put it on slideshow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So let us start. So topic for today's discussion, first topic is cancer screening in India. As we are aware, cancer is increasing day by day. So it is very important for this cancer to detect at an early stage so that we can cure that cancer. Earlier detection can cure cancer. That is the rule. So how to detect it early? The screening is the only way. So let us go one by one. What is screening? What are the screening methods? And what are the diseases which are eligible for screening? And exactly what is cancer screening? So this is an iceberg of disease. Everyone is aware. Clinically evident disease is so small. And subclinical disease, which is often more common, that is look like exactly this iceberg. What is screening then? It is defined as search of unrecognized disease or defect by means of rapidly applied test, examination, or other procedure in apparently healthy individuals. It is done on apparently healthy, applied to group of people, tests are arbitrary, based on one cutoff point or criteria, less accurate, less expensive, not a basis of treatment. So what is the advantage of doing all these things? So advantage is defined in terms of lead time. Here we can see on the diagram, if you go by a routine route, that is a disease onset detection to actual usual time of diagnosis, which is represented on A line versus first possible point of detection and uh, that is represented by screening time. So if you detect it early, we'll have this lead time benefit in our hand to cure that disease. So what are the criteria? which are eligible for screening disease and test. Important health, the disease should be important health problem. It should be recognizable. Latent or early symptomatic stage. Natural history of disease should be properly understood. Facilities should be available for confirmation. Should be a effective treatment should be available. Should have a good evidence that early detection and treatment has mortality and morbidity benefit. And all that should have a cost benefit ratio. The trace which we are going to use should be socially acceptable, valid, sensitive enough, cheap, easily applicable, and safe, and rapidly, easily applicable. So what are the issues during screening of a disease? The prevalence and incidence. The yield of screening disease as a screening is repeated over time. So first time screening is carried out, the prevalence screen, which is called cases of medical condition, will have been present for varying length of time. During the second time, which is called as an incidence screening, 
most cases found onset of disease between first and second screening therefore second screening is called as the incident screening so there are some biases before going to disease by disease i am just discussing what are the disadvantage or what are the biases that we occur during screening Sorry. that is a lead time bias that occurs whenever screening results in an earlier diagnosis than would have occurred in the presence and absence of screening unless an effective intervention is available lead time bias has no impact on the natural history of disease and death will occur at the same time it would have in the absence of early detection then there is also a length time bias length time bias is a function of biological behavior of cancer slower growing less aggressive cancer are more likely to be detected by screening test than a faster growing cancer which are more likely to be diagnosed due to onset of symptoms between scheduled screening so it has an even greater effect on survival statistics than a lead time bias so what are the diseases that we usually screen the cancer screening is done for breast cancer most common carcinoma of cervix colon cancer lung cancer prostate cancer skin cancer head and neck cancer and ovarian cancers out of which few are very uh, i very recognized and used in our cancer screening programs and few hours not that beneficial but still we are using it so first cancer is a breast cancer in which screening was started in the past modality used in the breast cancer screening are screening mammography just a minute breast usg breast mri clinical breast examination and breast self examination here we can see screening guidelines and recommendation age 40 to 44 option to begin annual screening then 45 to 54 it is just to give an idea where and the age 55 plus screening every two yearly so here is a breast cancer screening methods self examination we are actually everyone is aware of that also if other patients are not aware we can tell them there are youtube guidance also available how to go ahead with the self breast examination clinical examination should start between 20 to 39 every 3 years and at the age of 40 every year and mammography after age of 40 every year so what are the issues of this screening in the breast cancer screening sometimes there is a discrepancy between magnitude of the increase in early disease and decrease in the late stage cancer and cancer mortality suggests that a proportion of invasive breast cancer diagnosed by screening represent over diagnosis so there is a some issue of over diagnosis a confounding factor which regards to the mortality benefit of the breast cancer screening is improvement that has occurred in the breast cancer treatment over this period of time it is very well established that mammogram sensitivity is lower in women with heterogeneously dense and very dense breasts then sec third one is a false positive test substantial inconvenience and anxiety in addition to unnecessary invasive biopsies with their attendant complication about 10% of all women screened for breast cancer are called back for additional testing and less than half of them will be diagnosed with the breast cancer so remaining half of will live with the anxiety inconvenience and unnecessary biopsies the risk of mammogram is greater for a woman under the age of 50 familial then there is a false negative if there is a false negative even more dangerous delay in the diagnosis and provide false reassurance more common in younger women having dense breast and in women with the dense breast and there are certain cancers like a mucinous and lobular cancers and rapidly growing tumors which tend to blend with the normal breast architecture so in spite of having uh, having the disease there are false negative then there is a radiation induced breast cancer if you go ahead with the radiation again and again because the radiation used in the mammogram is 4 millisievert and it is estimated that annual mammography will cause one case breast cancer per 1000 i think it is little high on this for age 40 to 80 and radiation exposure at the young ages causes causes a greater risk and also increases the risk of breast cancer in having women having familial braca mutation brca1 and 2 mutation where we many time prefer mri so despite of all this a systematic review of data sponsored by us pstf that is us preventive service task force concluded that the regular mammography reduces the breast cancer mortality in women between the age of 40 to 74 years 
and the task force also concluded that the benefits of mammography are more significant in women aged 50 to 74 years. So here, how we go about what are the recommendations in a high risk woman and there is an average risk. What are the high risk is a BRCA mutation, which are treated with the radiation in the past due to Hodgkin's and approximately who have a 20 to 25 percent of greater risk of breast cancer. Then we go ahead with the MRIs and average is rest of all. Uh, so here is in this chart that we have already discussed self examination, clinical examination 20 to 39 every three year more than 40 annually. Just to repeat, mammography more than or equal to 40, it should be done annually as long as woman is in good health. Usually, it is uh, up to 74. And the other guidelines suggest 40 to 49. Decision, the, the decision should be based on one individual one and the take patient and the values into account. 50 to 74 every two years. So here, they give an option of every two years in 50 to 74 and more than 75. There is a current evidence are insufficient. Uh, of risk versus benefit. MRI, those are high risk that we have defined just now. They uh, more than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer screen with the MRI plus mammography annually. And 15 to 20%, the discuss option of MRI plus mammography annually and less than 15% uh, do not screen annually with MRI. This is what is guidelines. So this is all about breast cancer. Let us move to the next disease that is a carcinoma of cervix. In early 1940s, Dr. George Papanicolae first introduced pap smear. That is we called as a pap smear very commonly from this uh, scientist, great scientist. Cervical cytology has evolved over the years. Original pap smear used an ectocervical spatula to apply a specimen smear to glass slide and it later included in an endocervical brush. HPV, human papilloma virus 16 and 18 are the cause of more than 70% of the cervical cancers with increasing understanding of the role of HPV in cervical diseases. Interest in developing tests to determine the presence of HPV DNA and RNA has grown and HPV screening can be used along with the cytology in response to abnormal cytological tests that is a reflex testing as a standalone test. It is very high negative predictive value test. The utility of HPV test is limited in younger women because one third or, or more women in their 20s have active cervical infection at any point of time. For women over the age of 30, screening for presence of HPV DNA or RNA appears to be superior to cytology in identifying women at the risk of cervical dysplasia and cancer. So what are the guidelines suggest? So here, here it is just a minute give me okay so every three years woman 30 to 65 is before that they have given as 21 to 30 screen every three years 30 to 65 acceptable approach to screen with cytology every three years woman less than 21 no screening and more than 65 no screening so it is between 21 to 65 other guidelines also suggest the same screen every three years with pap test HPV testing less than 30 do not use. So 21 to 30 only PAP and more than 30, both of them. 30 to 30, <clears throat> 65 preferred approach with HPV and cytology every three, every five years and more than 65 no screening. In short, 21 to 30 PAP schemia every three years and above 30 to 65 PAP schemia PAP test every three years and HPV every five years are the appropriate screening methods. And no screening be below 21 and more than 65. Now let us move to colon cancer. What are the various methods of testing? There is a fecal occult blood testing. First screening test studied in prospective randomized control trial, rehydrated guanac test was used. <clears throat> Rehydration increases the sensitivity of fecal local blood testing at expense of lowering the specificity and high false positive rate. So what we are doing it very frequently, but it has a high false positive results. The flexible sigmoidoscope is limited to the examination of rectum and sigmoid colon only. A prospectively randomized trial once only sigmoid, flexible sigmoidoscope is demonstrate 23% reduction in colorectal cancer incidence and 31% reduction in colorectal cancer mortality 
after median 11.2 years of follow so definitely beneficial it is estimated that flexible sigmoidoscopy can find 60 to 80 percent of cancer and polyps found by colonoscopy but it is restricted up to only sigmoid colon then the most common and most preferred screening method which is used is colonoscopy a positive fecal all blood test or fecal DNA test or sigmoidoscopy warrants a follow-up diagnostic colonoscopy. So this is, a, we are talking about a screening, but the diagnosis, diagnostic colonoscopy is always required and biopsy followed by that. And what are the limitations associated with it? It includes the inconvenience of bowel preparation and the risk of bowel perforation. Although it is less, about three out of thousand procedure overall with nearby nearly all the risk among the patient who undergo colonoscopic polypectomy. The cost of procedure and limited number of physician who can do the procedure are also concerned. So there are limiting factors as it is a big procedure. Then there are some non-invasive CT colonography, virtual colonoscopy, a CT colonography involves the same preparation as a colonoscopy, but it is a less invasive, might have a higher complication rate, Sensitivity of CT colonography for detection of polyp more than 6 mm appears to be compar comparable to that of a colonoscopy in an experienced hand. But what are the disadvantages? That it requires uh, colonic preparation and the finding of CT requires follow up diagnostic colonoscopy. Rate of extra colonic finding of uncertain significance is high, 15 to 30 percent, and each one must be evaluated and thereby contributing to additional expense and potential morbidity. A long-term cumulative radiation risk of repeated colonography screening is also concerned. So what are the guidelines currently? Adult more than 50 years, every five years in combination with fecal uh, blood test every three years, 76 to 85 selectively screened and more than 85 not recommended. So every five years, that is what, or otherwise, we do a fecal occult blood test. If positive, we go ahead with the colonoscopy. Fecal occult blood test, more than 50 years, screening every year with high sensitivity, guanac based test, and fecal immunochemistry test only. We can do it annually. Colonoscopy, more than 50 years, every 10 years. So here's the sigma endoscopy is written as a five years. But the colonoscopy, more than 50 years, every 10 years. So it is not required to do it frequently. Uh, so the other guidelines also suggest the same every 10 years between 50 to 75 and otherwise more than 76 selectively and more than 85, not required. Fecal DNA testing, more than 50 screen and fecal immunochemical testing screen every year, CT coronography screen every five years. But what we are doing practically, we are doing fecal occult blood. If positive, go ahead with the colonoscopy. If colonoscopy not done, we can definitely advise them to do more than 50 years every 10 years. Because the colon cancer is a little slowly growing. If you get a negative result, there is no need to repeat. For 10 years, it's no family history. If it is a familial and inherited risk, then it is different. What is the risk? First degree relative affected with colorectal cancer or adenomatous polyp more than at the age of 60 years or two second degree relative affected by colorectal cancer. The screening recommendations are same as average risk, but starting at the age of 40. So instead of 50, we start this screening at the age of 40. If the risk factor is risk is little high, that is a two or more first degree relatives with a colon cancer or a single first degree relative with a colon cancer or an adenomatous polyp diagnosed at the age less than 80, 60 years, little more high risk colonoscopy is every five years instead of 10, five years and beginning at the age of 40 instead of 50 years. So the 10 year young, younger and every five years. Then there is a still higher risk. Uh, the, so we can see the gene carrier with familial adenomatous polyposis then sigmoidoscopy annually and which is beginning at the 10 to 12 years so it is very specific if you have a very important note point to be noted here is if you have any higher number of colon cancer patient means if any patient having colon cancer has a more number of relative having the same disease don't neglect it first your advice is to take a genetic counselor's opinion 
and this genetical counselor or uh, oncologist medical oncologist can guide them or surgical also oncologist can guide them ki whether that patient is having high risk of familial cancer and the person and the their family members can go ahead with this screening at a earlier stage as per the guideline and the patient is having a gene carrier at a risk of hnpcc colonoscopy every 1 to 2 year only beginning at the age of 20 years to 25 or 10 year younger than the earliest case in the family whichever comes first so how common is genetic actually it is less than 5% but if it is there and if you go ahead you if you advise them screening and if you can detect cancer at early stage you can save life even saving a one life of our patient is very very valuable to patient as well as us so let us go to the oral cancer now here there are very standard recommended screening methods we are doing commonly now there are certain which are not standard recommended method for screening screening of a cancer but we are doing it because of the high prevalence so oral cancer is one of the very high prevalence cancer one of the 10 most common cancer in world in india even higher because of the lot of gutka tambaku consumption and high prevalence in gujarat maharashtra pre cancerous lesion in the oral cavity natural history of oral cancer often has a pre cancerous condition so we have a word called as uh, cancer field field cancerization in which that if the patient is having a high, having a habit of chewing tobacco alcohol along with the cigarettes the all cancer cells are many cancer cells in the same area the field of cancerization are at a various stage of entering into cancer so even you cure one cancer there is a high likely that the cancer will reappear which is totally different but nearby places so very important to screen cancer even if you have cancer or no if you are having that habit detecting this is one uh, one of the way of screening it can be detected up to 15 years prior to the change in invasive carcinoma what are these leukoplakia erythroplakia oral submucosal fibrosis specially consultant who are dealing with ent dental they are the one who identify these things quite at early stage and ob obviously general physician as well but they should not neglect it because in next 15 years if they don't quit their smoking or tobacco habits it may get convert into oral cancer regular oral examination for detection of precancerous lesion can be helpful for early diagnosis of oral cancer evidence that the leukoplakia is reversible after cessation of tobacco chewing this thing is underlined because leukoplakia if you advise having your, if your patient is having leukoplakia and you advise cessation of smoking and tobacco then it can be reversible and that patient can prevent that patient's cancer in future primary healthcare workers are the best in the position to detect such lesion at early stage during their home visit so that is the most important thing primary healthcare workers can detect even the ent specialist and the dentist they are the one who detect it early regular health checkup plans are also useful to detect patient in a remote villages no specific guidelines for screening as far as oral cavity examination is concerned so my just advice uh, to all of our members is that if if you are taking whenever you are taking a personal history if the person is having habits of tobacco alcohol and cigarette definitely as a part of your routine you must be doing it but as a part of your routine advice yeah. give the advice of cessation of all those things but they are going to lead to some difficult cancer in future then the lung cancer lung cancer in usa actually they are doing it very regularly low dose ct scan when what is condition here we are not doing it regularly but most widely screen cancer in the developed country three tools are used putum cytology chest x ray and low dose ct various trials showing benefit of screening with low dose ct scan what is low dose ct a ct with a little less radiation exposure and which is useful for a screening for a diagnostic we will require certain uh, normal ct or hr ct high risk population and when we are doing this screening not for all it is in a high risk population in which screening is advised what is high high risk screening age between 55 to 74 years at least 30 pack years of smoking history 
currently smoke or ha have quit within last 15 years and relatively good health. So what is 30 pack years? If a person is smoking one packs of cigarette, which may contain 20 a day for last 30 years, it is 30 pack years. If he is uh, smoking two packets, not two cigarettes, two packets of cigarette a day, then two into 15 in next 15 years, he will be having 30 pack years of smoking history and he is eligible for screening. So between 50 to 74, if your patient is <clears throat> having history of 30 pack years of smoking, then definitely you should advise them low dose CT, which is not standard in India, but in Western developed countries. Why not in India? Because of the <clears throat> involved cost and everything. Because of the CT, we cannot give it to everyone. Uh, so the most difficult part here is the smoking history. Even the patient is smoking daily, regularly, is not going to reveal that he or she is smoking and is definitely not going to tell exact number of cigarettes that person is smoking. But it is very important to tell them the importance of this and take that history. Drawback of low dose CT, the risk of false positive finding in the first screening is 20 to 21%, which is quite high. Positive results require additional workup, which can include conventional CT scans, a needle biopsy, bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, thoracotomy. These all are very diagnostic invasive procedure, which are associated with anxiety, expense, and complication, like a pneumo and hemothorax after biopsy. The USPSTF guidelines gives the low dose CT a grade B recommendation, concluding that there is a moderate certainty that annual screening of a lung cancer with a low dose CT is of moderate net benefit in a symptomatic patient at a high risk of lung cancer based on age total cumulative exposure to tobacco smoke and years since quitting. So that's why we are not in India using because of there is a evidence is little grade B recommendation and it involves a lot of cost and false positive finding. But definitely for the individual patient, if they are falling into this criteria, we can advise them to go ahead with the CT scan of chest so that they can detect the tumors at early stage. During our last COVID, uh, period then the HRCT was then very quite form commonly there was incident detection incidental detection of lung cancer was there and which were at a earlier stage because lung cancer as we are aware it is deeply situated in a spongy tissue our lung then unless and until it is it reached to a certain size big size it will not show any symptom so uh, majority of our lung cancer, I can say 80% of our lung cancer, even 90% are present in at least in stage three or four. And we are left with only 5% which are operable one. And how to get this operable and curative is to do a screening whenever there is a high risk present. So it is important to know this. Uh, so let us, then the prostate cancer, very common cancer in the Western world. In India, also common, but little less recognized. Now we are finding more and more prostate cancers. The Hugh Hampton Young in 1903 first advocated the early detection of prostate cancer by careful digital rectal examination, screening with PSA and DRE first started in mid-1980. PSA is used as a screening test because it is objective, easily measured, reproducible, non-invasive, and inexpensive. Very simple test. Although it increases the detection of prostate cancer, but there is an issue of regarding utility of this test due to high false negative and false positive rates and low positive predictive value. But it is definitely a very simple test. Uh, so these are two cancers. What are the recommendations? Actually, in a prostate cancer, PSA and digital rectal examination are very commonly done at the age of 50, but it is not a standard recommendation recommendation as a screening because it not it is not going to fit it is not fitting into exact criteria of screening but definitely useful starting at the age of 50 men should talk to doctor about the pros and cons of testing so they can decide if testing is the right choice for them and if they are okay with it then uh, or they have a prostate cancer relative then definitely they can go ahead with the PSA scanning and digital rectal examination. So we have to discuss with the patient and if they are okay, we can go ahead. In ovary, CA125 and transvaginal USG, 
there is no sufficiently accurate test proven effective in early detection of ovarian cancer for women at the high risk of ovarian cancer and who have unexplained persistent symptoms the combination of ca125 and transvaginal usg with pelvic examination may be offered so it is not a perfectly fitting into screening test but definitely simple test can be done can detect few of our cancers so where do we stand in the screening in india so there is a national cancer control program nccp in 1985 and revised in 2004 the objective is primary prevention of cancers by health education regarding hazard of tobacco consumption and necessarily necessity of genital hygiene for prevention of cervical cancer secondary prevention in early detection and diagnosis of cancer for example cervical cancer breast cancer and the oropharyngeal cancer by screening methods and patients education and self examination methods strengthening of existing cancer treatment facilities which were inadequate and palliative care for terminal cancer this is our nccp national cancer control program and what is the conclusion of today's topic last slide the screening concept filled with the potential has been overburdened with the problems many of which remain unsolved the construction of accurate tests that are both sensitive and specific is key obstacle to a wide application of the screening but definitely there are many cancer where screening is available and the point is if you advise them screening if you can detect even a one cancer you can save that life so screening early detection is the most important thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity and i hand over my to the organizers hi shitaj can you hear me okay before prashant you start talking let okay. me uh, introduce these dr prashant kekar he is part of our managing committee and at special request from me he has joined us today he is not in mumbai uh he was at a camp uh, somewhere in the remote areas and he still managed to join in uh, prashant we would uh, um, love to have your comments on this and any other uh, suggestions that you may have or questions that you may have thank you sure thank you so much dr nilema i'll just introduce myself again i am a surgical oncologist at uh, bombay hospital preach kat and karindoja i have been a member of uh, amc managing committee and i would be i'm very happy that i've been invited here for this program which is a beautiful program organized by dr nilima and the program committee and a one wonderful participation by the members or and doctors of uh, mumbai onco care center so first of all i would like to uh, thank uh, shitej on this wonderful succinct and elaborate uh, presentation that he has made and he has touched upon all the topics i had a lot of questions prepared for him but uh, he has answered most of most of them through his talk uh Uh, the first thing shitej correct me if i'm wrong if i want to summarize your talk we can we can summarize the screening program as a simple test with a high specificity and sensitivity which can detect help us detect cancer at a very early stage so that we can have an impact on its prognosis there is no point in detecting a disease where we cannot change the prognosis either by by the uh, by the treatment we have or treatment we can offer to the patient uh shitij any such questions if i want to summarize it or any further thing would like to help me with hey, you are the best one who can summarize it sir so please go ahead no no any other other thing also i think which you touched upon in the last uh, uh, slide was that it has to be a government organized screening program to be having any benefit as individual hospitals or bodies we can contribute but unless it's a nationalized program we will never have a true number or its effect possible am i right or you think because small bodies as amc or as onco care mumbai onco care we can organize cleaning programs so you are definitely correct sir the government has a bigger role but as a part of a society if you can take a little part and we can uh, use this is like we are doing as a mumbai onco care center is also doing lot of breast cancer awareness as well as mammography camps and also cervical screening camps <clears throat> at the same time we are addressing uh mail with the psa testing and oral cancer from our part uh, as a part of a society we can definitely uh, do this things but definitely uh, it's a government who can make a big impact but uh, as a amc members and amc also body can organize sometimes definitely they are doing in the past but they can organize this thing 
uh yeah. dr kshita joshi i think uh, a point very well made because i think each and every uh, consultant over here is seeing a lot number of patients and creating awareness is a very important thing even ek aadmi ko agar aap aware kar sako and he can go down with a cascading effect of making other people aware i think we contribute greatly the intent of this program is to make our members aware of what is available in the market and what should be done so on a day to day basis also if you all take this message home that you can create a difference and you can make a difference i, I think we will uh, uh, be contributing in a large way definitely dr dr shitesh there are few questions from very interested members which i which i'll put across to you and you can answer them one is from dr vasan maske who is asking whether uh, is there any percentage of mortality reduction by cancer screening so you have any figures to give uh, dr shitesh Uh, so in my presentation i think uh, i have given few figures like there is uh, i can just open that thing if you uh, Shethi, i would like to add to that uh, dr prashant there was a large study of 75000 women in urban slums in mumbai done by the head of preventive oncology of tata my colleague dr surendra shastri who is now working at uh, in the us uh they found a 31% reduction of cervical cancer with just information and biannual visual inspection of the cervix with acetic acid and if not done by doctors in mumbai and there were two arms of this study in fact he received an international award but there was a whole ethical objection that why did other 75000 women not receive screening in a city like mumbai this was a 12 year study but what i'm trying to highlight by this is that Uh, awareness and not just opportunistic screening that when they come into your clinic you are doing it the same women who are highly educated affording come and do 3 3 times screening rather than that we have to reach out in the community and whatever are the resources it is going to happen and it's impossible to have a randomized double blind study which is showing some difference because internationally also it has been found that this is not possible for most of the gynec cancer screening and i appreciate what shitit showed initially there were eight cancers for screening three of them were female genital cancers ovarian and breast we have given over to the surgeons in some way but breast uh, cervix and uh, ovary and i think what every gynecologist or even in any primary care practitioner should say is one breast examination and uh, one even they say one pap smear in the entire life done in the mid life will reduce the uh, mortality from cervical cancer by almost one third this is the general statistics so i think we should uh, take this as a wake up call and thanks nilima for focusing on this aspect and i think our next speaker will talk about the uh, yeah, yeah. testing thank you yes. sorry just to add to this thing i can madam i summarize it very well i have mentioned one trial of colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy which has reduced the mortality by 23 to 31% so in breast in cervix in colon definitely it has shown a statistically significant benefit so they are in our screening programs there are other diseases which has not shown a statistical significant difference in the mortality prevention that's why the screening is suggested but not there in standard program so that is the point i hope that answers your question dr maske uh, there is another question by uh, dr divya singh uh, she wants to know from you sitej what is your opinion on whole genome screening and liquid blood blood based screening test for cancers so this is the newest uh, method i think one lab like some data genetics and they have a very great uh, paper which is presented in usa with large number of patients that are only blood test can screen for a breast cancer or something but definitely this is not there in our current screening but the definition of screening it it should be simple easily applicable test because these all tests are quite expensive genetic tests but definitely with this uh, taking information for this our uh, new research this can be in future but currently this is not in the current uh, screening method testing just to add to that i think the most important word is reliable we are not so reliable test as of today that we can base our treatment based on this uh, report so as of now we would not we cannot include them in screening but i like i said they are also very expensive there is another question by dr harsha shah but i can't really understand the clinical diagnosis so i don't think I, I, unless you want to specify dr harsha shah what exactly is your question uh, i i would suggest uh, 
If there are any no other questions, we can move on to the next talk. Yes, I, Dr. Prashant, I was suggesting that we can take about two questions uh, after each session for the speaker, so that right. we do justice to the last speakers also and don't run very late. And at the end, Absolutely. we can again collate the questions so that right. everyone can uh, uh, get a chance to interact. So, right. Manzar, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Richard, the MOC is to take care of the time factor and allow only those many questions so that the next speaker can come and speak on time and then uh, the remaining questions we take at the end. All right. Sure. Uh, so you all are going to put a stop to all our talks. All right. Sure. Sure. Ma uh, so uh, our next speaker for the day is Dr. Seema Jagyasi. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Seema Jagyasi, who is a medical oncologist practicing at Jaslok and Sefi Hospital. She has completed her DNB in medical oncology from Prince Ali Khan Hospital. She has an experience of over five years in medical oncology and has treated over 5,000 patients so far. Over to you, Dr. Seema, to take us through diagnostic tests in cancer. Good morning, all the members of AMC, and thank you, Dr. Reena, Dr. Nilima, and Dr. Hemant for inviting us here. And my in my session, I'll not be presenting any slides, but rather I'll be having more of an interactive session, and even I can be asked questions in between my presentation. So I will be talking about the diagnostic tests in cancers. So uh, there are some specific tests for each type of cancers and there is some basic idea for the diagnosis of uh, all the cancer types. So whenever a patient presents with some symptoms, the screening methods have been discussed by Dr. Shittij in very detail. So I'll be coming straight to diagnostic tests. Whenever any patient presents with some bothersome sim symptoms to the primary care physician. So primary care physician should keep some basic concepts in the mind before advising these tests. So the tests which can uh, lead to cancer detection are of various types like imaging, then uh, serum markers or blood tests. Uh, with these two are non-invasive and then the invasive tests like a biopsy or a colonoscopy which I, or a bone marrow uh, examination. These tests are some invasive tests. So first, when a patient presents with some uh, symptoms like fever of unknown origin, which can be anything malignant or non-malignant cause, or some lump in, uh, uh, in breast or lump in abdomen, how to evaluate it? So uh, first, uh, the primary care physician will examine and decide what tests to be sent. So most first uh, thing which they do which should be done is imaging. So imag imaging can be uh, either a sonography or mammography or a CT scan of the uh, local part or the CT scan, no, like the CT scan of chest or abdomen pelvis. And in cancer, uh, mostly we do the CT scan with IV oral and if possible rectal contrast also whenever indicated. So the scan should be with contrast and uh, other is the PET scan. Now, PET scan uh, is a very important tool in cancer detection and in uh, assessing the response of uh, cancer treatment. But this tool should be handled very carefully because every time if we perform whenever the PET scan is not really indicated and some metabolic activity here and there uh, can be due to other uh, non-cancerous causes also which can cause uh, too much anxiety. The results can cause too much anxiety uh, in the patient's relatives and some worries in the treating physician also. So PET scan is has some specific indications. So in, in first in imaging that is either the sonography, mammography, CT scan uh, with contrast and a PET scan. So uh, in the uh, mammography, the indications in the screening uh, are that after the age of 40, all the women should undergo annual mammography, which is uh, not so practical, but then it should be suggested wherever possible. So in the mammography, based on the BIRAT scoring or the sonomammography, uh, we can get an idea whether we are dealing with a malignant disease or a benign disease. So then if if the uh, by, from the BIRAT score, we think that this can be a malignant lump 
for the female who has come with the breast lump, we should immediately send them for a sono guided true cut biopsies. Now here in the past, more of the FNACs used to be done because of the ease. But now uh, I would like to emphasize that we should discourage the use of FNACs, particularly in breast lump. And we should advise more of true cut biopsies and always true cut biopsies because the yield is good and excellent and the, we can do some biomarkers like estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor and a HER2 receptor which can also help in the treatment and management of the breast cancer. So we should always suggest a true cut biopsy rather than FNSE in the breast lump. Then uh, in males also sometimes some male uh, they may present with the lump in the breast area, which also should not be ignored that if he's a male, we should we should also advise them sono mammo or the uh, uh, biopsy wherever indicated even in the male patient because male breast cancer is a uh, is a very much known entity. Then apart from the imaging, then comes the blood tests, which are serum tests. So there are some serum tumor markers. Now these serum tumor markers like which can be done in both the males and females are CEA that is carcinoembryonic antigen, CA19.9, alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. These can be uh, done in both males and females. So uh, these tumor markers, they guide, they not only guide in detection but also in monitoring the response to treatment but important point over here is that these tumor markers are not specific they may also be elevated in some non malignant inflammatory states for example ca125 can be raised in some ovarian cysts and in some infections and in some other non malignant condition so this in PSA can be raised in, uh, say, non-malignant prostatitis. So, this all the levels can should be taken carefully. So, and CEA, AFP, HCG, CA 19.9, these can be done in both the males and females based on the organ which we are dealing. CEA is for colon. When we are uh, assessing the patient with the colonic symptoms, CA 19.9 is for hepatobiliary tract. Alpha fetoprotein is for hepatocellular cancers. It's very specific. And also in, in the germ cell tumors, when we are dealing with the young females or young males with the, uh, with the testicular mass. So HCG and AFP are used there. Now in the males, the other tumor marker is PSA, which is for prostate. And in females, there are two other tumor markers like CA125, which is for the which is for the ovary or endometrium and CA15.3, which is a marker, which is used in the monitoring the response for the breast cancer. It is CA15.3. Then uh, there are some other blood tests like serum protein electrophoresis. Whenever we are suspecting multiple myeloma, mm -hmm. we can do the serum protein electrophoresis to see for any M band and this when this is the M band is present in protein electrophoresis, we can confirm it with quantitative immunofixation and serum immunoglobulin levels. So there are many death patients who present with pyrexia of unknown origin and all the infective causes like tuberculosis and all are ruled out. And then when we want to rule out the malignant causes, and particularly if patient has the bone pains, fever, weight loss, loss of appetite, then one test which we should not forget is serum protein electrophoresis. Also in the patient with no other symptoms, only with the raised creatinine and when the nephrologist is evaluating for the causes of renal failure, serum protein electrophoresis should be kept in mind. Now there are some hematologic cancers in which even simple blood tests can be used for detection from peripheral blood rather than bone marrow, doing the bone marrow. So one of such malignancies, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, that is CLL, in which bone marrow aspiration and biopsy can be avoided and all the information what we want for, diagnostic, for diagnosis and for prognostication of CM, CLL 
we can find from a simple blood test, which is from the peripheral blood. So then other uh, tests are invasive tests. Now, the invasive test, uh, the most important cancer test is biopsy. So whenever a patient is presenting with any can cancer symptom, the biopsy from the local side. So if it is a breast lump, the biopsy from the breast lump. If it is the altered, uh, altered uh, bowel habits, then we should do the colonoscopy. Or if the symptoms are suggestive of upper GI tract, upper GI scopy and the biopsy from the local site. If the patient is having some symptoms of hepatobiliary tract, then sometimes the EUS, that is endoscopic ultrasound guided biopsy from the biliary tract will be needed. So this biopsy will not only we can subject to the test like which will suggest whether this disease is malignant or non-malignant, then what type of malignancy that is adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma or any other like neuroendocrine carcinoma. Also, we can do immunohistochemistry, which will tell us that from where, which cell line this cancer has uh, cancer cell has started. So whether it is the squamous cell line, adenocarcinoma, uh, which is a glandular cell line or a neuroendocrine, particularly this is important when we have the malignancy of unknown origin, that is the cancer of unknown origin. So in that case, we have only the metastatic disease in the PET scan, but we don't know the primary organ. So their immunohistochemistry from the biopsy will play important role. And also the serum tumor markers, that which tumor marker has increased. So from where, and then there are some specific tests for the, uh, for the organ of origin. So then other diagnostic tests are uh, other biopsies like a liver biopsy, like a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy for hematologic malignancies. Then uh, some of the tests on which we do on the biopsy, they are diagnostic tests. Some are prognostic tests. From these tests, we can also guide the patient that what will be the prognosis of his or her cancer. All breast cancers are not same. All colonic cancers are not same. So, or lung cancers are not same. There is a lot of difference in between the two patients diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer or metastatic breast cancer based on the prognostication, prognostic markers which are present. So now the cancer therapy is moving more towards the individualized cancer care. That is the one, one uh, rule does not fit for all. So there are them, some tests which are available, which we will be discussing in the next meeting. And now today we will be, uh, we are dealing with the diagnostic test. Now the, about the tests from the body fluids. So body fluids like acytic fluid, pleural fluid, uh, or uh, the sometimes even the urine for cytology, this can give some import, uh, important information. So whenever a patient is having a pleural, pleural uh, effusion or ascites, we can uh, do the pleural fluid tapping or ascitic tapping and send for cytology. Now here one important uh, aspect is we should uh, tap as much as possible and we should not worry that uh, the patient will go in hypotension if we tap more. Particularly in malignant uh, situations, we can do uh, 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 the tapping as high as 2 liter, 3 liter, or four liter of ascitic tapping also along with the albumin transfusion. And in the aside, uh, pleural fluid, we can monitor and tap as much as possible. And we should send all the sample what we have tapped, all the uh, sample, not the small sample of say 50 ml, but rather all the sample of two, three liters what we have tapped so that the pathologist can do the cytospin and uh, centrifugation and extract the cancer cells and then the biopsy sometimes may be avoided if we have got sufficient cells uh, from the uh, uh, cancer cells from the cytology in these fluids like pleural or ascitic then and we can even do the IHC and specialized tests on these cells and the invasive biopsies can be avoided if we have good yield from these fluid cytologies. 
another test is a pap smear from uh, which also has the same principle then there is a urine for cytology uh, also can detect some bladder malignancies mm -hmm. then another test is a liquid biopsy which was discussed in the previous talk now in liquid biopsy what they do is suppose if the patient is not fit for invasive invasive biopsy for example in the lung malignancies if there is a significant risk of pneumothorax the location of the tumor is that if we do the ct guided biopsy and the there is high risk of pneumothorax or the patient is uh, from the medical point uh, he or she is not fit to undergo a biopsy so then we can do in some scenarios or now in most of scenarios we can subject them to liquid biopsy in which we collect the peripheral blood and send it for the uh, send it from for the testing so they detect the circulating tumor cells that is a circulating cancer cells and then from there we, they can give us the information that how we treat that particular disease this is now very commonly being done for lung cancers so this is uh, about the liquid biopsies Dr. so in uh, yes. there is a question which says that in case of biopsy slides nowadays use of maldi is becoming very common internationally how much can one rely on maldi observed slide studies and related back to diagnosis uh, sorry, I couldn't get your question. Can you repeat? In case of biopsy slide studies, nowadays use of MALDI, M-A-L-D-I, is becoming very common internationally. How much can one rely on this and relate it back to diagnosis? Uh, I didn't get this MALDI, M-A-L-D-E. What is that? So it is mass spectrometry matrix assisted laser ionization or deep desorption and ionization. Yeah, so we don't practice it here and uh, we don't practice it here in the routine diagnostics of the cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. And also one important point is as a primary care physician's uh, we all should be telling the uh, pathology, uh, the uh, the interventional doctors like radiologist who is doing the biopsy that to take multiple cores of the biopsy because sometimes the tissue is needed for a lot of testing and then the paraffin block gets exhausted and we don't have the tissue for the test. So we should tell or write in the prescription, please take multiple course of the biopsy at it as it will be needed for detailed testing later on. And we should also tell the patients or the labs that to preserve these paraffin blocks for few years, which they do, uh, because the later on these blocks are very important and this material can be referred back and needed for specialized testing. So, which will avoid subjecting the patient again to a procedure and also it will save on the cost that if we have the blocks of the previous biopsies handy. Any, any other questions about the diagnostic tests in cancers? Uh, uh. Thanks, Dr. Seema. You, you've touched upon most of the aspects. Uh, it's a very wide topic and a very, uh, you know, uh, cancer specific. So you've, you've actually summarized it quite well using various examples. Uh, the only thing I would like to, you know, more uh, educate the people is that most of the tests are dependent on the cancer and uh, specific to a patient. Like, the number of tests you would do on a bedridden patient with a stage 1 cancer would be varied from a patient who is otherwise active in a stage 4 cancer. So if all the tests that we do or direct have to be specific for that patient looking at his condition and at his stage. So there used to be a time once when just the spelling of cancer would be doom and people would say nothing doing further and just make the patient sit at home. And today we have a lot of stage 4 cancers which you will agree Dr. Seema with proper testing, proper staging, proper understanding of the uh, 
cancer, we can treat them and this patient is surviving for maybe yes. seven years and ten years. And so you want to highlight, pardon me? Uh, uh, many years and a decade also. In yeah, the absolutely. So, uh, uh, you know, a lot, lot, lot of people uh, would be having a few questions about, you know, this latest thing that we have nowadays, which is NGS. You want to touch upon that a bit just for the benefit so, of... Uh, yes, yes. Now the latest thing in the uh, which is just coming is next generation sequencing which we do quite often now next generation sequencing can be done from two samples either the biopsy paraffin block or from the blood samples so in this the genetic material of the cancer cells are studied and the what mutations a particular cancer is carrying that mutations are studied so suppose if we have two patients with lung cancer, both are with adenocarcinoma, both are in stage four. If we send the paraffin blocks of both the patient for next generation sequence, sequencing, the results which we get are totally different. The treatment which both of them will receive will be totally different. And the prognosis of the two patients, even if the same gross diagnosis their cancer cells are having different genetic material, they are having different mutations, so their treatment, their outcome is also very different. So this is what we are doing in the current age, that these tests are expensive. Uh, the one which are sent abroad, they cost a few lakhs of rupees, but then there are tests in available, similar tests available in India, which, which, cost, uh, which cost less than a lakh of rupees. So here, when we, we study what mutations a particular cancer is carrying and Based on that mutation, can we use any targeted therapy in the form of tablets or in the form of injections? We can target that cancer cells or whether immunotherapy can be used in particular cancer or of a patient. Will immunotherapy, will the patient, particular patient be benefiting from immunotherapy? That also we can uh, come to know from this highly specialized test called next generation sequencing. I think uh, Dr. Seema has covered a lot of points very beautifully and I think especially for gynecologists, I think we need to be aware that use of liquid-based cytology in is both screening and diagnostic in certain ways with the option of reflex testing. So a lot of the insurance-based healthcare, uh, as a follow-up to what Dr. Shitish said about cervical cancer screening, uh, in the West, people have moved from their conventional pap smear to LBC. So, uh, and it increases the interval of screening. And I think Dr. Shitish also shared an important point that there's a 15 to 20% reduction, uh, but we need to follow up a screening test with a diagnostic test, which Dr. Seema has beautifully brought out. So I think, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, one point, uh, yes. if I get one minute. So when we treat a cancer patient, we treat with standard guidelines, which are US FDA approved or which are so when now with the latest treatments, the patients, even in stage four, they are surviving years and years and almost a decade also. So we use a first line treatment. When they relapse, we use second line treatment. Then we use third line treatment. Then we use fourth line treatment. And when fourth, fifth, after fourth and fifth lines of treatment, when these lines of treatments get exhausted, then we get foxed. Now what to do? Because patient is in a good general condition, but inside cancer is progressing. So we need to control because then otherwise they will succumb to this disease. That time this NGS test has a role. So this NGS will tell us what specific mutations so we can sub we can give them some additional lines of treatment. These treatments are expensive, but now uh, many pol insurance policies and can cover this. So but then the uh, one point over here is that these tests take two weeks. They have done around time of two weeks. So uh, we should uh, in the from the when the patient is progressing on second, third line, then itself we should counsel them that get the NGS testing done and get, keep the report in your file, which will be needed in the later lines of treatment. But at that time, we may not have 15 days to wait for this report. Uh, Dr. Seema, there are two more questions for you, which we will quickly be taking. What is your opinion about uh, 
seeding of cancer cells along the track of ascitic tapping and how do we avoid it? <clears throat> so uh, whenever a patient with say, ovarian mass presents, so if it is a localized ovarian mass, which, has, which does not have a peritoneal spread, we should avoid doing biopsy in that mass. Because if we do a biopsy of such ovarian mass with the intact capsule, it can cause the seeding of the malignant cells in the peritoneal cavity and we are upstaging we are we are iatrogenically upstaging the cancer in that so here we should just refer that patient to the surgical oncologist and they will decide based on the imaging what is the next step whether the patient should be taken for a laparotomy exploratory laparotomy and there they will send the frozen section we should not biopsy such ovarian masses when ovarian mass has ascites, the capsule has ruptured, there is malignant ascites, there we can do the ascitic tapping. So in the stage of 3C or stage 4 ovarian cancers, we can do the ascitic tapping and send the cytology because there already the breach of the capsule has happened in the natural history of disease and there we are not upstaging the cancer. I one last question, I think I've already answered, but just if you want to answer it, somebody wanted to know uh, when would you do a sonography and when would you do a sono ma or mammography for a breast cancer? So you want to just so in breast, yes, in young females, the breasts are dense uh, as compared to the elderly females. In elderly females, we mostly advise mammography, digital mammography. Uh, but in young females, due to the de dense breast structure, the mammo will be, digital mammo will be a little difficult. So there, the sono mammo is advised. And nowadays, some when in our prescriptions, we write both sono mammo as well as digital mammo because we don't want to miss out even on the minor things. So in females with bre dense breast, uh, the sono mammo will be better uh, in young females. And also it has the less exposure of radiation. And to add to that, if I may add, uh, you know, in, in dense breasts, sometimes we do prefer MRIs also. Yes. So in particular indications, we advise MRI of the breast. And MRI of the breast, also the interpretation is very important. We should send the patient to that particular center where they are very used to interpreting the MRI of the breast. If we uh, don't send them to good centers, then the information can be missed and misinterpreted. So MRI breasts are, has specific indications. For example, the patients with the family, strong family history of breast cancer, the asymptomatic females who have BRCA positive or even asymptomatic males who, have, who are BRCA carriers, who have BRCA gene positive, for them to detect the cancers in very early stage when it can be missed in the mammography or sonography, we should subject them to MRI breasts. So where the even the very minute lesions can be picked up in very early stage, uh, that is stage one or even before. So then they can be handled accordingly. Uh, any role of elastomammography? Elastomammography... Uh, uh, can differentiate the uh, benign or malignant uh, lesions, but uh, which we don't practice uh, so frequently. How we use in the liver in the liver diseases, how we use elastography in breast, uh, we don't use uh, that common. So, your yeah, usual sonomammography, digital mammography, or in case MRI breast, that is what these three modalities we use very common. So, thank you. Just to add to that, uh, Dr. Nilima's question, elastomammography can sometimes give you an indication about whether, you know, on a sonography, we are suspecting to be malignant or benign. But again, we would rest more on a biopsy than just these findings for, uh, but it, it would give an indication. Am I right, Dr. Seema? Yes. Sir, biopsy is the most important tool in cancer treatment. The one test which has stood the test of time and which will always remain is the biopsy. Nothing can replace biopsy. How much advances in imaging or anything, but biopsy is the is the thumb rule and tissue is the issue in cancer treatment. 
Uh, Seema, one small question from my side is that as a woman, uh, when we go for a X-ray mammography, it is a pretty painful procedure, let me tell you, all right? And uh, patients are also wary that yearly, if I have to go and do an X-ray mammography, then will that be an induction for cancer? So what can you burst the myth for us or tell us the fact? No, the radiation exposure in mammography is not much and uh, it is much less than the radiation uh, exposure which we get from other uh, things like traveling in air, uh, aeroplane or uh, this thing. So the we have not come across the cancers due to the uh, radiation to the uh, which is given in the uh, during the mammography. So uh, mammography indications are annually after the age of 40, but it is not so practical. So, uh, but whenever possible, yes, uh, it should be done, particularly those who have the family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer. And whenever not uh, patients are feeling that it is a painful procedure and they are not comfortable, then at least go for a sonomammography from a good sonologist who, who is regularly doing these sonographies. So even a good sonomammography, the sonologist can tell you that now you need to go for a mammography or a MRI or a biopsy. There is one you. question uh, regarding thermoplex digital mammography. How much reliable is it? It is reliable, but it is not. Uh, the machines are not present everywhere, so uh, it's not so commonly being used till present. Thank you, Dr. Seema, for a very informative talk about uh, diagnostic tests in cancer. With this, we move on uh, to our next talk. Our next speaker for the day is Dr. Ashish Joshi, who's going to be giving enlightening us about advances in therapy. Dr. Ashish Joshi is a medical oncologist. He's the director and co-founder of Mumbai Onco Care. He has completed his DM in medical oncology from prestigious GCRI with a gold medal. He has an experience of over 12 years in medical oncology and has treated over 1 lakh patients so far. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ashish Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, for um, inviting me and MOC here and uh, giving us uh, an opportunity to interact uh, in this platform. AMC, as we know, is, is a very prestigious and very proximal to what all of us are. And um, it's always been a pleasure uh, to be here with all of you. Since I think a lot has been discussed about uh, cancer diagnostics, uh, as well as uh, uh, screening, uh, I, would, I would, without any further ado, I would just go on to specifics of my talk, which is about advances in cancer therapy. Now, probably all of us know that you cannot crystallize this full information in 30 minutes, and that's not the intent of the discussion at all. But I would just want to highlight upon uh, with my colleagues and with my friends here, few of the nuances, few of the changes, and few of the rules of thumb that we follow as far as the medical oncology treatment in 2022 and 23 is concerned. So the rule of thumb first is that size, size matters, but not always, not that much. It's not about where it is. It is, it is all pervasive. Treat the lump medically, not always with a scalpel. Only thing which is constant is change. Tumor personality changes too. Select the target and hit. There is a less collateral damage. And cancer therapy, who does it and where it does does matter and has a lot of impact on how, how the way the outcome of these patients would shape. So the first rule of thumb, we know the story of the ant and elephant always need not necessarily be that elephant is more damaging than ant. Look at a situation where you have an eight centimeter breast lump, which is estrogen receptor positive and has got KI 67 of 5%. So for an audience here, KI67 means it's a reflection of the tumor proliferation in an individual patient. 
that means tumor growth rate is only to the tune of 4 to 5 percent and it's a estrogen receptor positive tumor whereas look at a situation when there is a one centimeter breast lump which is triple negative and i think we all know that those patients who have got estrogen receptor negative her2 negative breast cancer and here in this same individual there is a ki67 of 67 to nine of 95 percent same breast lump in an individual one on the right side one on the left side the right one is a eight centimeter breast lump which is er positive with a very slow proliferating index whereas you have a tissue which is one centimeter breast lump which is triple negative and has got a proliferating index of 95 percent that means the ability of the tumor to double and grow is 95 percent you would certainly wonder which one is worst does eight centimeter matters or one centimeter matters does size matters yes size does matter but when you're looking at the tumor biology or a personality of the tumor for me a one centimeter breast lump which is triple negative and ki 67 of 95 percent it's much worse than the eight centimeter breast lump which is er positive and ki 67 of five percent so for that individual patient i would be far more concerned about a one centimeter breast lump versus a eight eight centimeter breast lump which is er positive and you would ask me why dr zoshi is this the case number one is the proliferation index the ability of the cancer cells to grow fast in an eight centimeter er positive is very very slow whereas the one centimeter breast lump which is triple negative is growing very very fast and secondly because of the estrogen receptor positivity i have got an oral drug a simple drug like tamoxifen which would control the disease much better than the triple negative breast cancer which would require a heavy cytotoxic chemotherapy drug and if actually you look at the survival curves for these two uh, group of lumps you would you would definitely understand that this one centimeter breast lump which is triple negative has got significant high risk of recurrence versus a eight centimeter breast lump which is er positive and ki67 which is five percent so size matters but not all much not always also look at a situation you have a two centimeter high grade sarcoma in the abdomen a very very undifferentiated sarcoma which is possibly excised versus you have a eight centimeter low grade non hodgkins lymphoma in an abdomen now we would wonder whose outcome is going to be better it's it's obviously very logical that it's a eight centimeter low grade lymphoma which number one has got a low proliferation number two has got a better effective therapy and is likely to survive more than a two centimeter high grade sarcoma so the first rule of thumb that size always is not important it's the biology of the tumor which is important and that governs the modern medical oncology treatment that we do in 2022 the second rule of thumb and the big question is that it's not where it is and it is all pervasive the bigger question which often often we stumble upon is that there is a patient whose surgical removal of the lump has been done and has developed liver metastasis in third year why does it happen the gross tumor has been removed but there is a disease which is spun up in a period of 36 months and this is the big question which cancer researchers have answered over a period of time and it is conclusively proven that cancer has got micro metastasis as you could see here those micro metastatic cells which are hovering in the systemic circulation in the bone marrows and the studies have conclusively proven in a node positive breast cancer for example there is a 20 percent chance of bone marrow micrometastasis which is which is beyond the confines of the clinically relevant test that we use today including a pet ct scan so it's important that we look at cancer as a systemic disease and treat the disease systemically, systemically as well as locally and hence the concept of adjuvant chemotherapy hence the concept of new adjuvant therapy because unless you control this micrometastatic disease you are unable to reach the utopian goal of cancer cure in an individual patient and the eradication of micrometastasis with systemic therapy is something which resonates the landscape of cancer therapy as we speak today 
So whenever we are looking at a logo original treatment of a disease, it's very important that systemic therapy takes a precedence or sits with a scalpel. And that's how a cancer treatment is been shaped. That's how the local original treatment protocols have been shaped. So it's not about where it is. It is all pervasive. And that's the second rule of thumb, which governs. The third rule of thumb, always not a scalpel. You have something better. Use the right tool, use the right, uh, use the right uh, imaging, use the right concept to control cure a cancer. A wine bottle, which is seen here, you can have a cookie cutter, you have a wine opener. Which one would you use? The cookie cutter is certainly stronger, but that did not necessarily work for opening of a wine bottle. So let's look at a situation that there is a three cent centimeter breast lump, which is HER2 new positive. You give new adjuvant therapy. That means you give chemotherapy or some targeted therapy prior to definitive surgical removal. And to our surprise and a pleasant surprise, Almost 60% of our patients, now that we do neoadjuvant therapy in this setting, there is no tumor in the resected specimen. Similarly, look at the rectal cancer. The situation which has come up that you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus radiation and, they, and then there is a concept that if the radiological imaging or a biopsy post that shows negative results, then possibly you could observe. Now, these are the extreme examples and I don't say that surgery is out as far as the tumor treatment is concerned, but the local original treatment concepts have changed. So gone are those days when a gynecologist or a surgeon sees a breast lump and you remove the tumor, it doesn't work. You have to get a core little biopsy of that breast lump to be done, understand the personality of the tumor. And if the tumor size is any way bigger than even 1.5 to 2 centimeter, and the patient has got HER2 new positive disease, then it's prudent and it's mandatory that we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy first and not operate. Similarly, you've got a tumor or a breast cancer, which is triple negative, and the size of the tumor is more than two centimeter. The guidelines suggest, and that's the science which tells that it's the neoadjuvant therapy which rules the roots, not the surgery upfront. So gone are those days of breast lump being excised, sent for a tissue, then do a PET scan and then do a modified radical mastectomy. That's you're, you're, you're abolishing the anatomical planes and the outcome of those patients wherein upfront surgery has been done is inferior to those patients who have received new adjuvant therapy. So all regional treatment of most solid tumors as we speak and as we talk, most of the solid tumors which were beyond the realms of medical oncology have actually got medical oncology upfront as far as the local original therapy is concerned. So it's a multidisciplinary care, which is important. And I don't negate the importance of surgery here, but there are, there are situations wherein a systemic therapy takes a precedence over local therapy. So it's using the right opener for a wine bottle rather than a cookie cutter. It's not always the scalpel, use the right tool. That's the next rule of thumb that resonates in the treatment. The fourth rule of thumb, that only thing which is constant is a change and the tumor personality changes too. And that's where probably we're alluding to the talk which was preceded uh, here by Dr. Seema, that we are talking about understanding the tumor biology better, understanding of the tumor personality better. Look, these are all the tumor cells which are hovering around here. They look so similar from the optics, but you start opening them and then every individual tumor is so disparate in its genotype. It's so disparate in its personality. And previously it was all about reading a tumor under the microscope, but it's all about reading a tumor now into the genes. Try to understand the personality of the tumor. An individual A will look exactly like an individual B, but the mindset of an individual A might be totally different than the mindset of individual B. And this principle is true even for a cancer cell. And what next generation sequencing typically a buzzword of molecular oncology, what we do is try to understand the tumor biology, try to understand and read the personality of the tumor better by going deep into the micron, deep into the genotype of a cancer and try to find out how these cancers are behaving. So the only thing which is constant is change and the tumor personality changes too. So let's look at a situation that there is a three centimeter lung cancer with a 
single bone mets in a two individual patient both are 50 year old gentlemen both are non speakers non smokers so if you look at optically exactly the same tumor burden which a patient a and a patient b has but what we did we tried to find out the personality of the tumor and what we realized that patient one has got a egfr mutation which is the driver mutation which is governing the growth of the tumor and because we have got effective therapy to target that particular target or that particular growth signal this patient lives for 42 months whereas there is the same patient who has got a 3 cm lung cancer and has got a bone metastasis exactly looking optically similar in terms of phenotype but does not have driver mutation he lives for 18 months 8 months alone sorry for the uh, transcript error there understand the personality of a cancer that is the innovation in cancer diagnostic and that has got direct impact on how we treat the patients so molecular oncology is the buzzword in 2022 at the risk of being simplistic one may say that if you are not a molecular oncologist you are not a medical oncologist and vice versa so this next generation sequencing this molecular oncology understanding the tumor personality has suddenly made vibrations in the treatment of uh, cancer care in 2022 and probably going on uh, we all will be a molecular oncologist eventually than a medical oncologist as we speak because this all facts which i'm talking about is not utopian it's very much reality is something what we all practice on monday morning so we know that in a patient one we know the driver mutation which is governing the growth of a cell and we have a drug to counter that and look at the difference in the survival 42 months versus eight months and that's true that's a triumph of the innovation in diagnostic and what we call as molecular oncology so pathology in mutation driven cancers again resonates you put a Pandora's box and you could put multiple stage four cancers, colon cancer, lung cancer, gallbladder cancers, and so on and so forth. They look exactly different phenotypically. They conceptually are advanced stage disease, but look at how different they are. There could be a 16 year old male with a colon cancer with a DMMR mutation. There is a 53 year old male gallbladder cancer with HER2 new expression. There is a pancreatic cancer with adenocarcinoma, which is PDL1 expression. There is a BRAF mutant melanoma. And you look at all of them. They look phenotypically so aggressive, but the personality of those tumors is quite different. And if you could understand that, then outcome of this patient is going to be dramatically different because of the advances in the therapy that we have. So the rule of thumb again is pathology, biology, tumor personality. Try to understand the personality of the tumor, which is very, very important. The second last rule of thumb is select the target and hit. There will be less collateral damage. A beautiful picture. There is a car which is damaged. The car is damaged, but look at the collateral damage that this particular car breakage has, has ensued. This is similar to what happens in cytotoxic therapy. When you're using conventional chemotherapy regimens, you are decimating the cancer cells, but along with that, you are decimating the normal cells as well. And that's why this fear about chemotherapy, this fear about the side effects, this fear about alopecia, this fear about mouth ulcers, this fear about bone marrow suppression, and this fear about, in general, what about chemotherapy? And that possibly uh, needs an alteration because now, as we know that the modern warfare has changed, we are very much concerned about the collateral damage. And if possibly we can have a lesser collateral damage with a appropriate target being selected and hit, then possibly the surgical strikes could be better. So the rule of thumb is select the target and hit. There is a less collateral damage. We have got drugs called as targeted therapies, as probably you all know. And I would not dive deep dive into it because they are typically jargons. There are various oral tablets which are available. There are monoclonal antibodies as well. And what conceptually they're doing is they're identifying a target in an individual cancer and trying to attack them alone so that the normal cell affection is much less. And compared with the cytotoxic chemotherapy that we use, these drugs or the monoclonal antibodies are have a lesser side effects. Mind you, they do have some toxicity and its toxicity has to be managed. But, but over a helicopter view, if you look at, then the toxicity of these regimens is far lesser 
compared with the conventional cytotoxic cocktails that we use. And the efficacy also seems to be much better compared with monoclonal antibodies, now compared with conventional cytotoxic drugs, because we are simply targeting what we know. Oral tablets and monoclonal antibody targeted therapies governs, languishes, controls, and resonates all solid tumors across and all blood cancer across. I would not label a single cancer in which this particular targeted therapy are not in vogue and they're dramatically changing the outcome of an individual cancer patient because it's a personalized cancer care that we are delivering. There is a doubling or tripling of survival when we use them even in an advanced setting and hence you see that the longevity of cancer patients has dramatically increased uh, with the use of uh, advances in the molecular oncology and the targeted therapy. We have got new drug, a new word which has come, new phrase, which is called as operational cure. The diseases which are typically in an advanced stage, but have got plummeted to such a low level because of the advances in the therapy that you're probably looking at a, a deeper and longer disease control. Typical example is chronic myeloid leukemia, wherein with the use of imatinib and a drug similar, if you give them for a period of XYZ period of years, and you can probably even discontinue the treatment and these patients are operationally cured. Similar case in multiple myeloma, similar case in metastatic cancers. I would label that immunotherapy in lung cancer has dramatically changed the outcome. And I'm, I will allude to in a couple of my next slides. But a concept of operational cure has in vogue because of the innovation in the cancer treatment. And we are possibly looking at a deep punchy control of this so-called difficult to treat patients. Select the target and hit is a less collateral damage. And I the talk would be extremely incomplete if I do not discuss about immunotherapy. This is just one slide. The concept again is target, but the target in a different way. You are stimulating or evoking a tumor response against the cancer cells, which is a natural thing to have happened. But because of the tumor micro environment, the tumor cells and the tumor antigen prohibits this, immuno, uh, this immune environment to become active. But we have the therapies which will again stimulate the immunity against the cancer cells, the specific drugs which have been available, which can control the disease. And this cancer immunotherapy kills again with identifying a target in a different way, but with a lot of less collateral damage. So again, the cytotoxic uh, side effects versus immunotherapy side effects, there is a disparate proportion in which those side effects ensue. Mind you, cancer therapy, immunotherapy, there have been... A lot of things which have been marketed, but it's not just about a vaccine or a two. There are PDL1 or a checkpoint inhibitors, which are the intravenous drugs, which are given in a particular setup that resonates the landscape of cancer immunotherapy. And cancer immunotherapy has changed dramatically the treatment outcome of large number of solid tumors and hematolymphoid malignancy. The last, last, last rule of thumb is that cancer therapy, who does where, where it, where it is done matters a lot. There was a Tata Memorial Hospital paper which was published way back seven years back. Cancer therapy done by a medical oncologist versus others. The survival difference of 30%. And why does that happen? You cannot, you cannot play chess on a winter morning on a road. The better play to play a chess would be somewhere inside the house. Similar to Akin, this survival difference is because it is not about giving IV fluids. It is very important to understand that chemotherapy is not about just taking the intracath and starting a D5 or NS. It's not all about mixing the drug. It's all about dose calculation, dose escalation, dose reductions. It's all about side effect management and that is very important. So what this paper actually suggested that the place where the medical oncology is available and the setup is there then the unnecessary dose reductions are reduced. The dose calculation is optimal because for me, uh, adriamycin 50 milligram, if it's done to 500 milligram, then you're going to have a catastrophic impact on the outcome. The side effects are going to be so important. So where it does matters, who does matters, that's because there is a science behind it. It's not about just giving IV fluids. Dose calculation reduction side effect management is very, very important quality of nursing and you see this typical extra physician injuries which are typically seen in a setup where appropriate care is not taken. PICC line chemoport management 
onco dietitian onco physiotherapy support staff trained rmos a constipation at 3 o'clock also has to be managed a diarrhea at 3 o'clock also has to be managed a mucositis has to be managed the patient needs comfort of a system and that is very important and that's why the place matters and the outcome the attrition the ability of patients to adhere to a treatment is very very important depending on the place where it is done so these are the rules of thumb size matters it's not it's not as much as size it's the personality it's not about where it is it is all pervasive treat the lump medically it's not always with a scalpel only thing which is constant is a change tumor personality changes too select the target and hit there is a less collateral damage and cancer therapy who does where it is done matters a lot this is how typically a cancer therapy looks like 1940s we were aborigine there was chemotherapy then came the stem cell transplant then came a drug called as interferon but now we have got beautiful oral tablets and this is conceptually how a treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia has grown but again it echoes in various solid and hematolymphoid malignancy which resonate the landscape of of cancer therapy as we speak so there is a dawn of new era in cancer prevention cancer treatment and cancer diagnosis and uh, this is this is how a medical oncologists were few decades back you are hitting the cytotoxic cocktails you don't know what you are hitting and probably the dream of a medical oncologist has come true there is an individualized cancer treatment approach and provide a tailored treatment and that's what moc gets to you all and thank you thank you for your patient and kind uh, listening and i would be happy to take any questions thank you so much <laughs> hi ashish uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation i think you'll be soon we'll come to know of you as a man with six thumbs <laughs> <laughs> i was waiting and wanting more fireworks from prashant kerkar because this is and medical oncologist versus a onco surgeon no it, it is like, like you, no like you mentioned it is never versus it is all together we yeah. can only walk hand in hand for the better interest of the patient though in his talk he tried to nudge the surgeons a bit <laughs> ashish any role of role of surgeons in cancer therapy in the <laughs> 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 so i think the mission kekar on board <laughs> yeah so the message is very uh, loud and clear that surgical uh, treatment and interventions are very very critical um, uh, the reason why i trying to highlight upon the fact that uh, the concepts have dramatically drifted over a period of time and uh, it's all for the end of the day it's the patient who is going to be benefited and that's that's very important and i think that's where uh, um, sort of uh, where we are <laughs> no so ashish a very important point you made and i think we should make it together i think we both see a lot of patients who come to us after their surgery though be being a surgeon for a second opinion and you being a medicologist for uh, for chemotherapy but what we usually find is surgery upfront is not always the truth in all cancers you know it's no longer a a, a surgeon specific or a medical oncologist specific tumor we have to sit in a tumor board with a patient a medical oncologist a surgical oncologist a radiation oncologist maybe even a physiotherapist or a, a radiologist and then in the better interest of the patient we decide which patient requires new adjuvant therapy which patient would be eligible for upfront surgery and so on so we do find a lot of patients in our opds who are operated and come and even we feel as surgeons that oh this patient probably should have received new adjuvant therapy first and uh, no should have been operated later in so that the prognosis of the patient patient would have changed any thoughts on that absolutely i agree with prashant completely here and that's especially true for breast cancer so typically your node positive disease we saw uh, and triple negative are operated up front or even a breast lump has been removed and then subsequently a mastectomy has been done and what it basically does is violates the anatomical plane and subsequently the outcome of these patients is so poor uh, when compared to giving a new adjuvant or a systemic therapy up front so i think this local original therapy uh, which is so important for most of the solid tumors has has seen a sea change and i that, that is something i think you and me would easily acknowledge prashant as as the way we see uh, uh, happening uh, even today yeah absolutely fine i think in the interest of time we can move on to the next talk thanks again ashish a very wonderful presentation like i said we will now on call you the man with six thumbs <laughs> and very good six thumbs there were no questions there were no questions in the chat box so ashish i think you've done a complete job thank you it could be vice versa also probably i have not done anything <laughs> anyways no, thank no, you I, I...
Thank you. Yeah, definitely not, Ashish, because I think even when we did the pathology thing, uh, your talk was very well appreciated. And today also you have given a very different way of presenting a talk. You know, how to make the talk interesting is also something uh, we need to learn. So thank you very much. No, also how to make a talk medical oncology specific. <laughs> 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 thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi, for a very informative uh, and concise talk about cancer treatment, advances in therapy of cancer. Now we have our next uh, speaker. Can we have the CV, please? Yeah. <laughs> our next speaker is Dr. Smith Shade. Dr. Sheth is a medical oncologist at Mumbai Onco Care, Thane and Mulun. He completed his DM in medical oncology from the prestigious Tata Memorial Hospital. And he has an experience of over seven years in medical oncology and has treated over 20,000 patients so far. Over to you, Dr. Sheth, to take us through the rehabilitation. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I would like to thank AMC for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, for this talk. So, uh, is my screen visible? Hello? Yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah, yes, we can see. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, as you have seen, the screening of cancer, then diagnosis, and then all the latest advances of uh, in the treatment of cancer but as we you know accompany the patient through his journey from initial being a localized disease to later being a metastatic disease a recurrent disease we find that patient apart from being getting just chemotherapy or symptomatic management they need a lot more things uh, sometimes we are capable of providing sometimes we because of our own uh, lacunae we are not able to provide them so this is where palliative care comes into the picture uh, disclosure, I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, I am sympathetic towards palliative care, but I'm not an expert in palliative care. Uh, so this is my just small foray into and trying to explain how and when it is uh, required. Yeah, uh, so. So on 26th May 2014, the World Health Assembly, which is the decision-making body of WHO for the first time passed a resolution declaring that palliative care should be an integral part of all healthcare. So we see this is a recent uh, field and, and uh, as uh, I was doing my uh, DM in medical oncology in Tata Memorial in 2015, at that same time, the first batch of uh, MD in palliative uh, medicine was also started. So this is a recent field, uh, but a much needed field as you will see. So basically, what is palliative care? Is it just care at the end of life, only concerned with cancer? Uh, palliative care is care which can only be given in hospice. Is it only about curing the patient? The answer is no. It is much more than that. It is about caring for the patients. It's about healing the patients, being proactive. And it can be practiced in hospital, in outpatient basis, and even at homes. And it's a public health issue which we all need to be aware and sympathetic towards. So palliative care is for all health-related suffering. It can be a muted suffering of this poor patient or it can be a suffering of this air condition, life in prison uh, patient who has been on ventilator with multiple lines uh, in his body. This is the basic definition of palliative care. It's an active holistic care of individual across all ages with serious related suffering due to severe illness, any disease, especially of those patients which are near the end of life. The aim is to improve the quality of life of the patients, their family members, and their caregivers. There are three basic components of palliative care which are bound together by the most important thing, which is the skilled communication. And these three components are symptom relief, psychological support, team, and partnership. And this, uh, we should do it with hope, honesty, and openness. Palliative care is an, there was a need for an integrated approach, an approach to uh, you know, combining life prolonging measures like chemotherapy with symptom relief therapy. And it's also dealing with uncertain life expectancies. Patients have a lot of questions regarding this. Uh, there is frequent reassessment of the goals of treatment. We need to uh, sit with the family 
and with the patient rediscuss as the stage and the disease evolves so palliative care is patient centered rather than disease focused the aim the palliative care physician is to treat the patient rather than the disease to treat the symptoms rather than the disease uh here accepting death and also life is important we try to enhance a partnership between patient and the carers concerned with healing rather than curing the aim is to heal the patient uh, healing is about right relationship with self others environment and god and as the saying says you can't die cured but you can definitely die healed to die healed for the patient and the family members means to be able to say and to convey to their loved ones i love you please forgive me i forgive you thank you goodbye this few words are very important in a patient's life who is knows that he has a terminal disease as we see uh, it's not a single doctor centered approach a complete team work is required for total care doctors who take the decisions on what drugs to uh, they give nurses to make sure that patients are counseled properly the drugs are administered properly social workers to help in delivering home care to the patients and their caregivers to assist patients in logistics issues volunteers and physiotherapists and occupational therapists in palliative care four main areas are focused we try to help the patients socially uh, there are a lot of patients has social issues lot of family issues interpersonal issues this is moving beyond plain and simple treatment so knowing that aspect trying to help them trying to help them physically treating the symptoms treating the problems which they suffer emotional treatment trying to understand what the patient or the family members are really going through and try to just uh, lend a hearing uh, ear to them may also be you know provide them a lot of relief spiritual treatment as the patient's journey goes uh, as the journey advances they you know each and every patient's spiritual aspect changes we also need to be aware of this so this is basically what palliative care there are three phases and the palliative care and then the end of life care and then the terminal care so palliative care is Uh, for all those patients who are living with a life limiting disease it involves symptom management maximizing the quality of life uh, palliative care also involves palliative chemotherapy uh, palliative radiotherapy especially to the areas of the uh, body which are causing a lot of pain palliative surgery for example a uh, patient with uh, breast mass which is fungating uh, bleeding can undergo palliative surgery to provide symptom relief maximizing community efforts not only the patient but the community of the all all our medical community as well as patients their friends the social support is important in end of life care the medical treatment is ongoing uh, usually it can be given in a hospice as well as at home we all know uh, at in the end of life care the condition is not going to be curative but just try to make the patient and family members comfortable the patients have weeks or months to live and also include symptom management specialized uh, spiritual health care and as well as psychosocial support terminal care is as we see uh, when patient as at the has few days to live symptom management is important counseling the family providing psychosocial support to the patient as well as the family members is important and as, and also is spiritual care so historically um, there was patient was diagnosed with a cancer and then he used to uh, uh, suffer from death and in between nt disease therapy was going on and then the initially the concept of end of life care was only in the last 6 months of death and then after that the patient caregivers are offered bereavement care but now the present concept of palliative care has changed as we can see uh, between presentation and death nt disease therapy as well as symptomatic treatment go hand in hand and depending on the stage of disease one can take over the other so this ensures that the patient's journey is much more comfortable much more holistic and then similarly uh, six months before that more intensive treatment and bereavement care comes into the picture so if you ask what the seriously ill patient really wants he wants appropriate treatment of pain and all his symptoms 
they know that he is not going to survive long there is no point in discussing that same thing again and again with him but uh, symptomatic care of the patient even a 10 to 20% relief in the pain will do him a lot of good the, all the patient wants to achieve a sense of control be able to walk go to the washroom there has to be a uh, bowel bladder control which is important for patients they want an honest communication regarding their care their stage of the disease uh, what they are going to go through in the next uh, few days or months they expect coordinated care throughout the course of the illness and this is very important that uh, most of the patients want to avoid inappropriate prolongation of the dying process even the family members they don't want to be a burden on their family uh, they want to strengthen relationships with their loved one and they want a sense of safety in the healthcare system maybe at home in hospice or in a hospital so what are the benefits of palliative care palliative care it provides an evidence based measure for good symptomatic management uh it provides a common platform to discuss the goals of the care with the patient and family and advance directives to us you know what all goals are going to be there and these goals keeps on changing as the disease stages changes so the treatment approach uh, what does the palliative care treatment approach involve it involves all kinds of therapeutic procedures including in very uh, severe pain we do do invasive procedures like now block patient with an esophageal cancer with dysphagia we do esophageal stenting this is a type of a palliative care procedure and the main aim is to control pain as well as distressing symptoms and these therapies will not change the course of the disease it will not make the patient life prolonged but it will make the life more meaningful the intention is to relieve the distress and the symptoms so the goal is to eliminate reduce discomfort to improve the quality of life and to honor patients this is for dignity so these are the most common symptoms which uh, end of life patients or patients with uh, chronic metastatic disease do face uh, pain we'll discuss it in the next slide dyspnea shortness of breath a patient with a malignant mass in compression of the trachea he knows it is metastatic but the sense of choking or the sense of dyspnea that they go through uh, are probably or benzodiazepine may help in relieving the anxiety of that dyspnea and nasal oxygen may help in relieving the dyspnea control of secretions patients uh, we do counsel the patients to not to put them on invasive ventilator so it is very difficult for family to see the patient gasping with lot of secretions in this especially symptoms we do use anticholinergic agents like lycopyrrole to reduce the uh, symptoms there is lot of agitation delirium Uh, especially in patients with brain metastatic disease judicious use of uh, benzodiazepine does help uh, so that it uh, gives some comfort to the family members anxiety depression uh, hearing a diagnosis of cancer can be a depression so it is not that these symptoms occur later in the disease they can be present from day one it is our job to look for those subtle uh, hints that can uh, you know senses tell us that the patient is anxious patient is depressed fatigue is lot of fatigue is important you know we say to the patient that now it is because of chemo you have to bear it but we uh, so there are certain tests which may help to look at cause of fatigue but just normal physiotherapy change in nutrition may also help to overcome fatigue anorexia cachexia as we know uh usually is treated with uh, anabolic steroids uh for some patients appetite stimulants in some patients constipation can be multiple factorial the treatment of constipation if we can is not only symptomatic but if we can try to find the cause and treat the cause for example uh of a patient with a colonic mass or colonic stenting can be done to relieve the constipation uh with patient with multiple uh obstruction in the peritoneum because of the disseminated peritoneum disease can be treated with uh, metaclopramide steroids to reduce the peritoneal edema and relieve constipation all these are conservative measures we are not looking for something uh, miracle so this is the basic uh, management of the pain the treatment of pain should be by the clock it should be by the ladder this is the who ladder for pain and by the class of the drugs which have to be given and specific attention has to be paid uh to what kind of pain it is what kind of dosing the patient is going through 
there are two kinds of pain patient usually require a constant uh, periodic control of pain and in between there will be breakthrough pain which can be uh, treated with sos medications so basically there are three class of uh, drugs one which are non opioids which are used to treat mild pains like paracetamol and sedatives then we have opioids like morphine uh, sorry yeah morphine codeine etc and then uh, we have adjuvants like which are specifically useful for neuropathic pain like tricyclic antidepressants and uh, corticosteroids and anti epileptics so for mild to moderate pain we usually start with a non opioid if the patient pain doesn't worsen we step up go up to opioids plus minus adjuvants and the last is to shift the patient to opioids the aim is to select the appropriate analgesic drug a uh, drug for a bone pain will be different from a drug which used to treat the neuropathic pain we need to prescribe the appropriate dose which should be judicious uh, especially in the terminal ill patient not worry about long term side effects we should administer the drug by appropriate route whether oral or iv select the appropriate dosing interval treat both persistent as well as breakthrough pain titrate the dose and also help the patient manage side effects like constipation delirium nausea communication this is the most important part uh it should communication a good communication is sensitive delivery of bad news to the patient to the family member a communication should be such that it encourages questions from the caregivers from the patients and we as a uh, physician should be willing to talk about dying because if we are con uh, we are open to discussing that they will be open to discussing their issues uh, we should assist the patient and family members in making decisions the decision should be patient specific as well as realistic palliative care also involves taking care of the patient's family families have a lot of guilt issues i am not able to provide optimum care to my uh, to my father or mother there are a lot of unresolved family conflicts a disease like cancer has impacts the patient and his family financially physically mentally we need to be able to try to help them in each and every aspect uh, there are a lot of complex dynamics involved uh, there is a role of hospice care in this especially for patients uh, with prognosis less than 6 months uh, what does hospice care help is it reduces hospitalization and high intensity measures at the end of life care uh, and often it goes under utilized if we discuss it clearly with the patient and their caregivers then uh, they would most of them would opt for this hospice care rather than spending their last days in uh, icu there are four basic cardinal principles first we should respect the patient autonomy we should be beneficent we should do good for the patient we should be non maleficent that is we should minimize harm to the patient by unnecessary invasive procedures and we should use justice and use in the sense that we should provide a balance between the personal need of the patient and societal resources if there are limited beds in the icu there is no point in admitting an end stage patient and using a ventilator which anyway can be used for a curative patient or a young patient who may require it for a couple of days and we can save his life these four cardinal principles need to be applied against the background of respect for the life of the patient and acceptance of the ultimate inevitability of the death this is the unfortunate truth in our profession uh, moving on to home based care uh, this is the picture of what a home based care looks like uh, it provides greater independence for the patient patients do get their treatment at their uh, surroundings which they are comfortable they feel safe which is convenience for them imagining a patient who is bedridden just for a rails tube or a foley sensation has to come to a clinic wait in the line for his turn you know the relatives have to uh, bring the patient down on a stretcher get him in an ambulance rather than this we can shift the care at their home this will provide relief for the family caregivers saves money and it prevents avoidable trips to the hospital so this is my life slide and i leave you with let me live the way i want to live until i can thank you for your patient hearing so uh, thank you very much dr smith for this wonderful presentation on a much neglected and very very important topic in cancer care as we all know 
uh, there is still a lot of dearth of uh, treatment centers for this uh, patients who require palliative care. Uh, we have very few. I think we have one of the oldest centers in Mumbai at Bandra, which is the Shanti Avedana, which is which is the one of the oldest hospices that we have, and it's doing a wonderful job for uh, our patients. So what our patients are really hoping for is uh, when they hear the death nail, as if you know, when a doctor says there is no further effective cure that we can offer to the patient. That is when, and patients have already spent so much on the treatment part of it earlier, that when this stage comes, most of the families find themselves with short of money, short of space, and of course, a uh, horrible uh, or not so good future to look at. So, uh, any other centers that you know of which you would like to tell people which are available, if you are aware, around the center of Mumbai for palliative care? We have Bhakti Vedanta, uh, and then we, uh, there are certain institutes we do provide home care. Uh, we, as a part of MOC, do provide home care and palliative care to our patients. And it's very simple. You just Google palliative care in uh, India, palliative care in Bombay. You'll get a lot of uh, uh, lists of. I think we lost you there for a moment. Uh, so, anyway. yeah, we as. We, as a part of uh, you know, giving a holistic care to patients, we do provide palliative and home care services to our patients. Uh, we have two doctors and two nurses who visit the patient as on, on an on-call basis. And uh, regarding the centers, uh, you can just search in Google palliative care in Bombay or palliative care in India. You'll get a lot of centers. And the good thing is a uh, significant number of them are NGOs and do provide care at uh, subsidized rate also. Okay. I think uh, Mother Trust, uh, Dr. Anand Parihar uh, runs Mother Trust and they uh, do a lot of palliative care at home and they were in fact wanting AMC members also to contribute uh, to this, uh, reserving a few beds in their hospital uh, for palliative care so that patients do not have to uh, run around to cancer centers and do that. Uh, Dr. Smith, there is one small query from my side. When a person enters the stage where he requires now palliation, he knows that he has come to the end of his days. How often do you see requests for euthanasia? How often do you see patients trying to commit suicide? And how do you deal with that? Uh, yes, so we do come across patients. Uh, looking at euthanasia is more from the patient's uh, perspective that when they come to know that these last few days are going to be uh, spend in pain, a lot of symptom burden, uh, they do come across with that respect, uh, with that request to do so. Uh, we especially tell and counsel the relatives that you know, at this end stage, a patient starts gasping, don't put the patient on ventilator because as such, you will not be able to remove the patient from the ventilator. So that is what we counsel from beforehand only. And uh, the fact that you know it's our fault that the patient comes to this stage, we need to be aware we need to have a foresight that these discussions will happen down the line so rather than waiting for a stage when the patient and the relatives are in a tension that he suddenly becomes uh, his physical condition suddenly deteriorates it's better to find a time just uh, when we come to know that he is not going to do well he's not responding to this treatment to you know discuss when they are in a calm or mood so you know discussion and communication is a lot more important i would say this Dr. Smith, one more question from my side again. Uh, we, I'm doing a lot of work on organ donation and cancer patients are definitely out of that framework for organ donation. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you throw some light on whether these patients uh, can go in for corneal uh, donations? Because there are a lot of patients you know, who feel that after their uh, death from cancer, they can still be worthwhile and useful to society. So there are certain uh, places where corneal transplants are uh, taken from uh, cancer patients. What are the contraindications here? Contraindication, uh, I not uh, know much in detail about this, but just looking, thinking over it would be a patient with a disseminated uh, cancer, uh, stage 4 metastatic, where the disease burden is high. Uh, ethically, I feel it is wrong to transfer a cornea from a patient who has a disease to someone who has a lot of normal life to live. So uh, I don't know, there will be a lot of, we need to have certain guidelines, especially. Uh, 
and there are experts in like yourself in the field to come up and set up these guidelines uh, rather than I mean, we can counsel the patients but uh, i just feel it's morally uh, if a patient has a metastatic cancer say, how would i justify Uh, you know, I, I I agree with you here, Smith. It is not worth taking that risk of even minimal miss risk, if at all there is, uh, because finally it is uh, it's a cancer. We just saw uh, sir, sir telling Dr. Ashish Joshi telling us it is a blood borne thing. It's a systemic yeah. uh, mm-hmm. disease. So um, how much ever emotionally patients may be wanting to live after their death. All right, this is one thing we should be trying to avoid counseling patients. Thank you. Prashant, do you have anything to say to this? Unmute yourself first, please. Prashant, unmute. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he has covered most of the topics very well, and uh, we can. He has answered the questions, so I think we can move on to the next. We are on time. Ah, uh, madam, one point here. Ah, uh, there is one palliative care center called Sukun Nilaya, and it is near Mahalakshmi. Ah, uh, it is at Mahalakshmi. uh so they also offer a uh, free services and good and dedicated services to the terminal cancer patients and that too like uh, free of cost oh great that that is thank you dr sigma that was uh, that was a very valuable input uh, so i think people now over here in, in whoever is attending this seminar knows where to send patients for palliation at a less cost and i think we'll be doing a big soci- service to society so thank you very much manza you can take it further thank you dr smith for a wonderful uh, talk about palliation uh now we have the next speaker for the day is dr pradeep uh, kendre dr pradeep kendre is a medical oncologist at mumbai onco care porifri and malad he has completed his dm in medical oncology from gcri with a gold medal he is an honorary consultant at hcg karuna and lotus hospital Dr Pradeep has an experience of over 9 years in medical oncology and has treated over 50000 patients so far over to you Dr Pradeep yes uh, thank you thank you very much ms manja uh, uh, it's been always privilege to be on this platform uh, thanks dr nilima and dr pradeep i just yeah. interrupt there's a lot of disturbance if, uh, i don't know where it is coming from uh Am I am I audible now? Properly? You're audible, but there's a disturbance huh. in the background. I I think it's from the main file. If we can remove it, otherwise you can proceed. Proceed. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll remove the blue paper. Okay. hope uh, it will be audible now properly is it uh, the background noise is still there uh, dr pati one minute we can hear you well but yes one minute it, it, it's gone now i think everybody else can mute themselves it's coming from somewhere else yes ha okay thank you very much uh, now uh, after smith's talk i guess there is nothing to uh, explain here the regarding the cancer rehabilitation thing Uh, as all of you know ki uh, the every time of our life is considered as a precious moment uh, because uh, once it goes uh, we will not going to leave it in a physical format surely with the sc- help of the screen with the help of the memory we can live then today being in sunday and uh, since last one week every one of us is totally burn out we are spending time here in the afternoon time uh uh is there any particular reason why we are here today is this just a, a credit score because whenever i am getting some sort of invitation for the talk uh, i see a, a one thing very dominantly fo- focused here is the credit point is it one credit point two credit point that is the only reason we are here or is there something different for which we are here it's like our belief our idea or our opinion in regards to this topic we need to change for that reason we are here or just a credit point uh, 
now uh, the thing is how serious we are about the rehabilitation process uh, if i focus myself if i paint my picture here i feel before entering into the uh, oncology field i was not pretty sure about this cancer rehabilitation process this could be because of our education system my own interest this could be because of my super normal stimuli uh, uh, super normal stimuli means we, our brain is preloaded with certain sort of information and when that information comes in a exaggerated manner our brain lighten up we always want to do that thing it's like the same thing uh, the basic information uh, regarding the food uh, it is already loaded in our brain and when that thing comes in a exaggerated manner we try to choose that only attractive portion the engrossing portion now if i give a, a choice here to choose one donut here most of us would going to choose a this one because it is pretty attractive for us the same thing happens in regards to medical field we are always focused uh, we we try to treat the patient because we always feel that ki they are a challenging aspect for us but as far as the rehabilitation concern uh, somewhere the super normal stimuli prevail the uh, rehabilitation thing now and for that reason i guess ki to change my own understanding my belief in regards to uh, rehabilitation i am here uh, i we are here to go beyond our perception we are here to think beyond our thoughts this picture is a self evident you could see here hardik pandya in 2018 he had a spine injury while having a, a, a match against the pakistan it was a, a ranji uh, not ranji it's a group a match and that time he sustained some spinal injury over a period of time he underwent surgery this was the uh, rehabilitation time for picture and this is the present how he is now and we have uh, experienced his uh, way of play uh, uh, recently in the world cup as well fortunately the cancer rehabilitation and the non cancer rehabilitation things are more or less same only now if i see the proper definition of cancer rehabilitation here it is a process that helps the cancer survival to obtain and maintain the maximum possible physical social psychological vocational and spiritual functioning within the limits that is created by the cancer and its treatment now in the rehabilitation we need to focus on the physical journey of the patient emotional psychological social spiritual and the vocational journey but cancer survival continuum as all of you know it starts with the diagnosis then the treatment then post treatment surveillance management the components of this comprehensive care already dr smith has discussed uh, thoroughly here but i'm just reiterating here is the rehabilitation medicine the pain palliative anesthesia orthopedic surgery physiotherapy or psychotherapy occupational therapy speech language pathology now there are two different model based on which we work uh, for the rehabilitation one is a, always a kind of in case of oncology setting it's a oncology perspective model where in oncologist will guide a patient to uh, go to the physiotherapist to involve the psychologist on the physician and lot many thing uh, and the control will be carried by the medical oncologist here or any surgical oncologist or radiation guy person then the second model is a physician oriented the physician uh, uh, who knows much thing about the cancer related uh areas they can guide the patient for the lymphedema they can guide the patient for the psychology work up the medical thing and pain and palliative uh we will be having journey uh, through these two main cancer the breast cancer and the head and neck cancer in the breast cancer a uh, lot many patient the way we doctors avoid the rehabilitation uh, in genuinely if i am given a option of one patient of newly diagnosed breast cancer and the simultaneously the second patient sitting with the post treatment as a survival uh, even the most of the time my focus is always on a treatment and the patient themselves they are not aware about the rehabilitation the process uh the in case of breast cancer the common thing what we see is the lymphedema so there are different stages of lymphedema stage 1 2 3 4 up to stage 3 we can surely treat this uh, we can surely treat or the prevent the further progress of the disease but stage 4 is always challenging and once it happens it remains irreversible it is always a kind of a stage for the patient 
the option for this lymphedema are a kind of compression bandage then manual drainage process uh, then in stage 3 uh, lympha fresh machine uh, we have this lympha fresh machine in moc now the most important aspect if you see the uh, human era the human when they came into the uh, universe that time nobody was knowing the what is the definition of the beauty eventually the people have started making the definition of beautifulness and uh, unfortunately the media has manipulated modified edited this definition for their own sake and because of this two thing they have set one benchmark for the beautifulness now the people who are not following who are not reaching or who are not satisfying or fulfilling the fulfilling the benchmark of this beautifulness they start devaluing their own existence and especially we we are seeing in our cancer uh, field ki patient are losing their hair they are losing their organ and somehow they feel ki they are not fulfilling the the, the, the benchmark of the beautifulness that has been uh, dictated by the few people but most of the time we don't understand ki this beautifulness definition has come from the people who are Uh, insecure about their body uh, somehow the few people has adopted this definition for gaining the confidence and most of the time the the subconscious or the hidden motive for this thing is the company is a sale uh, sale of their products here but a uh, lot many patients they don't understand because they uh, will will be will be not in a phase to reach to that deepest root of the motive why what is the definition of the beautifulness but initially our focus is always uh, try to have a change from external then try to go into their mind so to prevent the hair loss here and to fulfill the definition of the media or the community uh, we have this paxman machine we have uh, this uh, supported system wherein patient would not feel that ki they are losing something precious from their body uh in regards to head and neck cancer what we see commonly here the patient that mainly uh, uh, suffer with the mouth opening issue jaw drop cervical contracture dryness of mouth wise productivity for the opening of the mouth there are lot many instrument especially my ent colleague might be using this thing these are uh, mouth opening kit the physiotherapy for uh, dryness of the mouth visually it happens secondary to the radiation related injury to the parotid and for that we have a different oral solution to create the artificial saliva we have uh, artificial sprays then the swallowing exercises then this neck beds and the voice producing machine now the most important aspect that we usually uh, thoroughly didn't discuss Uh, don't know the reason but if you see here whenever any life crisis happen to the patient uh, i see lot many time is ki their life paradigm get shifted suddenly this their thinking their life perspective uh, their point of view towards the life it changes they become more religious people become they adopt the yoga related process they adopt the meditation so why it happens it's because uh, they are always recycling the pain which they have suffered during their treatment during their diagnosis uh, and they try to continue that pain throughout their present moment then the second thing is ki our process of imagination so imagine they they, they imagine this thing in a such way that it creates a, a huge fear in them but fear if you see how this terminology of fear has coined here is the fear was created to prevent us from getting physically damaged fear was created to getting us for, for the prevention of the getting dead unfortunately lot many time we ourselves and our patient as well use this fear as a to be in a comfort zone and most of the time because of that thing uh, their potentials their ability to live a life to live into the moment Uh, it remains under develop it remains untapped here uh, this is one of the experiment that you might have been seen or heard about this thing uh, this experiment was uh, carried on uh, carried out a few years back in amazon uh, forest uh, the scientist has created artificial forest 
they they have created a lucrative soil wherein all the organic bacteria and the fertilizer not inorganic fertilizer or the natural resources they kept into that particular zone uh, they they created a uh, oxygen they they provided a proper amount of the carbon dioxide to balance it out and the artificial not artificial the proper sunlight and they they created the forest and eventually after certain time the people started noticing that ki after 3 to 4 years span the the trees which were grown at particular level they started falling down there was nothing to uh, remain untouched to happen such kind of event scientist was with confused ki why this is happening but later on they came to know what they were missing is the wind if you see a, a tree which is growing in a open environment because of the wind wind is always a kind of pressure system for the them them wind is always kind of agitation for the them for them so to uh, fight with the wind to fight this pressure to fight this pain the usually the normal tree they deeply root their Uh, uh they deeply penetrate their root into the soil and somewhere that has helped them to remain stable in our life this negative experience like anxiety pain fear worried they they are kind of pressure system uh which we should take that thing as an opportunity for ourselves for the patient as well if just simply if i want to if i simplify this thing more is Uh, you might have seen the lot many uh, people who are uh, going on the top of the mount everest they feel some sort of uh, uh, breathlessness kind of issue the reason being the pressure of the oxygen is pretty less there but at the ground level this pressure is always not there so to maintain the shape of the body to maintain the integrity of the thoughts we need a pressure and without pressure uh, we cannot come with the with our greatest potential life is not fighting with us because we are weak life want us to take out the best from us so these are the pressure and somehow we need to convince the patient ki this pain anxiety fear kind of these are the negative experience for them and they need to use this neg- negative experience to grow themselves to change their perspective towards the life uh, this is the same thing for the growth now in emosis understanding the spiritual journey is not a yoga spiritual journey is not at all meditation surely this is a some way or the entry point to go deeper into that thing but the spiritual journey is like this page it is a emptiness every day is the empty for you and you need to write new story if you carry the uh, the past pain if you try to recycle that pain if you try to bring that pain uh, uh, throughout your life if you start imagining the fear would going to damage you and this is the reason we being a team in moc we being a almost 90 to 20 medical oncologists we are, we are able to focus on these six areas the physical journey emotional journey psychological and the spiritual journey here uh, we have a lot many services in our basket uh, the cancer day care targeted palliative dr smith has already mentioned this all stuff and now uh, i i have shown you the regarding the one uh, one diagram the belief how that belief thing come we being a doctor or any human when they enter into a, some professional they have certain motives and this motive is most important motive is the financial appetite once that financial appetite finish then the next appetite start is a value generation and once that value generation finish the next appetite is always a community survey social transformation and uh, for that thing social transformation uh unfortunately when we focus on the social transformation we try to set up the processes to have the changes in the community but if at all your identity if you at all your belief is a different then you will not be able to bring the social transformation as far as this rehabilitation or the cancer care concern here uh, so my identity is ki i need to take uh, consider myself ki uh, i i will be focusing more on the uh pre treatment treatment and the rehabilitation process so that i could set up the similar process for them and i would have a uh, uh, outcome in uh, regards to the same now where we are in moc in moc 2017 as a, a mediocre people mediocre doctors uh, 
uh, we were just growing so we were having we were just multiplying the thing like anything uh, that is called as a growth but eventually were over the period of 1 to 2 years span we are realize that the just multiplication is not at all important and there we started bringing in the discipline and the norms into our system and that time we realize ki it's a growth plus progression so we were progressing progressing here but now we are trying to enter into the process of success success means it's a growth plus progress that is multiplication plus disciplinary protocol along with the humanity along with the spirituality so by bringing in the rehabilitation by bringing in the change in our belief system we are trying to be successful uh, organization for the community thank you very much thank you dr pradeep for this wonderful uh, talk that you have given and also given some very interesting uh, articles as examples for your talk uh, so what what areas in cancer care do you think really think patients do require rehabilitation so we usually limited to maybe you know the parts like the limbs which re require rehabilitative work or maybe the oral cancer patients But what what particular aspects of cancer care do you think where rehabilitative work is most important? Sir, so, uh, the most important thing is that uh, what happens, what we see, we try to treat that thing. But oh. what we can't see, we it's very difficult for us to treat that particular portion. Uh, the most untapped area, what I feel in my practice, is the patient psychology, the patients and their families' psychology. uh that is the area which is which has remain untouched and many time patient are scared to see the psychiatrist uh, psychiatry guy or the psychologist the reason being their understanding about this topic they feel ki are evidence doctor kada jal like okay so we we are condition in a such a way that ki looking at this people seeing the psychiatrist uh the people will going to see in a derogatory manner they will not going to take us in a right way but somewhere right. we doctor ourselves require such kind of time to time consultation but we unfortunately ignore that portion sir right i also feel this visit to psychologist is very important because in our clinics we have to deal with such varied amount yes. number of patients that we really can never can fully address their questions or give them maybe the time they they require yes. but a simple act like wearing a wig in a patient who was lost the hair due to chemotherapy or using uh, breast implants or uh, you know uh, uh, bras which can give uplift their self appeal all these small things also help in the patient developing her confidence and moving out but as what we routinely find is such patients do not move out of the house they are not ready to interact with other people and this, this affects their self esteem and uh, you know it affects the whole family as a uh, so uh, any other aspects about the you know maybe apart from this limb and oral cavity or breast where you feel rehabilitation uh, helps a particular person maybe in a gi where a patient may have a short bowel syndrome or something like that yeah, so, so uh, besides this particular two malignancy that are pretty commonly we see in our practice the other is the as you rightly mentioned the gi malignancy the the type of food that we eat because if you see a uh, indian patient whenever you are seeing patient the first question they will ask is sir what to eat uh, shall i eat the sugar free, sugar free food or shall i take a milk or not so that type of counseling the entry of the nutritionist here is a pretty important rather than we being a guiding them because we have uh, some limitations about our understanding uh, in regards to the nutrition if somebody ask me sir nutrition has said advise us ki not to take a sugar but i am not convinced the reason being ki my idea is limited because i don't have any science behind this thought okay but somewhere somewhere i need to go beyond my own thoughts ki those the science which i am not seeing here doesn't mean that it is not existing okay that that thing we need to accept so the changes should happen within us rather than the into the patient once our belief get corrected then we can change the system sir right absolutely 
Dr. Pradeep, I think you have uh, presented a fabulous uh, look through to the entire rehabilitation program. And I feel accepting yourself as you are and value yourself on your achievements and contribution to the smile of others is more important than the external beauty because beauty within is irreplaceable. Psychological support, like you said, is very, very important because how you look at a loved one staying with you Suffering from cancer makes or breaks the moral. This also reminds me of an African tribe. Uh, there's one word which we used to use, the Ubuntu. If you remember, it is I am because we are. All right. If you Google search the Ubuntu terminology, it says that this is a oneness, is an understanding of the interconnectedness of all life. A golden thread of goodness connects all life from the lowest creature to the highest. This golden thread of goodness is commonly known as love. Love. So love becomes so important at the end of life and this is the right time to show if you have not as yet shown love to your loved ones please guys don't waste this time this is the time to show maximum number of love and a lot of patients the immunity and the immune system gets a big boost just because of your love thank you yeah also so also to the very important topic or uh, point that dr nilima has raised we as doctors also, when these patients come to us and we find that we really can't offer much, it is very important for the patient to feel that doctor is giving us a Boost. kind cure. If they can express their feelings, their pain to the doctor and the doctor gives a patient here, that also goes a long way in you know the patient feeling good and walking out of their room with a smile on their face. So I think that is also equally important. Sir, uh, the MOC Never. consultant, uh, sorry, sorry, madam, please, please. No, no, no. Please, please, so, please, please, so, so in, in MOC consultants, uh, what I have noticed, uh, I didn't see, I didn't had a chance to interact with the uh, other people by sitting in their own OPDs. It's a bit difficult. Uh, there is always conflict of interest. But uh, whenever I'm going, I'm meeting my colleagues, what I have uh, experienced with them is key. A lot many of us, they are treating patient, whenever any patient is seeing us, they are coming to our OPD to create the feelings, to create the trust that this person would be able to treat me. He has that empathy, he has that sympathy. Uh, you just think he, uh, it took almost 15 years to understand this medical science. And we being a doctor sitting at the other side of the table, we are telling all the medical science to them within 10 minutes. So. Is it is it kind of thing? Will they going to accept that thing? The terminology itself, it is a kind of alien and it will going to build up the uh, more stress in them. What we need to show them is key. we are confident enough. We are your family and we will be going to treat you. You are in a safe hand. That's what we focus. Sir. I agree. I agree. A yeah. lot of patients at this time, they come and keep meeting you only because they want to feel, talk to you and go back. They also yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. will not offer much, but they just yeah. come to your OPD to talk to you, tell their feelings, you know, get your reassurance and go back. In in my OPD, uh, uh, hardly I discuss medical science, sir. <laughs> right. I know, uh, this cancer is such a huge topic and it is such a horrible thing. It's really like if it is not diagnosed on time, not treated in time, not treated with the latest technology, it is going to take you away from your loved ones. So the most important aspect and not the least important aspect, we have though kept it at the last, but prevention is always better than cure. So uh, we have uh, now the next topic is on prevention, lifestyle changes and vaccination. Manzar, could you please introduce our next speaker? So our next speaker is Dr. Preetam Kaliskar, who's going to uh, give us an excellent, uh, who's going to tell us about the most important aspect of everything, vaccination and lifestyle modification. Dr. Preetam Kaliskar is a consultant, medical oncologist, director and co-founder of Mumbai Onco Care. He has completed his DM in medical oncology from the prestigious GCRI with a gold medal. He is an honorary consultant at Jupiter and Kaushalya Hospital Thane. Dr. Preetam has an experience of over nine years in medical oncology and has treated over 50 thousand patients so far. So one thing, madam, if you have noticed, all the speakers today are gold medalists in their respective branches. So over to you, Dr. Preetam Kaliskar. Hi, uh, good afternoon all, and thank you for the uh, warm welcome and the kind introduction. After the, I think it has been a long rally of uh, presentations since morning, 
i will be focusing something uh, which is uh, comes before the occurrence of cancer and which uh, is the question which most of our patients do ask uh, their relatives do ask how can we prevent it and also a common question which always comes is is the incidence increased bad gaya hai kya is abhi kuch zyada this is what they usually ask uh, is it more in recent times is lifestyle changing it this is very very common and very pertaining what they ask so my presentation would be divided into two parts first is a small part of vaccination and the later part is about the lifestyle modifications i'll just uh, share my slides so how many of us really believe that infection can actually cause malignancy so whenever it uh, whenever we think about it uh, the first thing comes to our mind is tobacco smoking alcohol infection is something which we hardly discuss that it can cause malignancy but yes there are around 13% of cancers which are caused by infection human papilloma virus which is a known virus to cause cervical cancer are there any other infections yes we have hepatitis b virus hepatitis c virus this can cause hepatocellular carcinoma we have hiv infection which causes kaposi's sarcoma non hodgkin's lymphoma we have epstein barr virus which causes burkitt's lymphoma and this is a very very common test we'll choose which you'll see after an upper gyroscopy that is an h pylori testing done this is known to cause mild lymphoma so these are many viruses and bacteria which can cause uh, malignancy is there something which we can do for this prevention yes the only cancer or which can be prevented by a vaccine is cervical cancer and the only vaccine available to prevent any cancer is an hpv vaccine there is nothing uh, there is no other better way i would say to prevent cervical cancer hpv is one of them safe sexual practices and post exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis b and hepatitis c yes uh, the other two are important for healthcare workers hepatitis b vaccination is very helpful the impact of cervical cancer 6 lakh cases new year every year around 3.5 lakh deaths of cervical cancer hpv vaccination this is something which is not there in our immunization but uh, it might should come it is to be given uh, uh, after 9 years of age to both boys and girls and up till if not given in the first 11 to 12 years from 9 onwards up till 26 uh, they can be vaccinated they can be vaccinated up till uh, there is no sexual contact if it is mixed missed at 26 year what is the schedule the vaccine is usually given up till 15 years at a schedule of 0 6 and 12 15 years and onward it is 0 1 2 does Uh, so uh, those who are there in the presentation uh, would definitely question does it really helps in preventing a cancer so there is a lot of data to suggest that this vaccine usually prevents cervical diseases carcinoma in situ and the recent trends uh, which are available suggest there is a reduction in cancer incidence so definitely uh there the pendulum is now pointing towards what which we help and now people have started recommending hp vaccination and it should be done so from this part onwards we will be going to the lifestyle and does it really impact and does it really this a uh, culprit or a cause for malignancy we all know the disease of civilization uh diabetes blood pressure is something which i think has discussed presented hundreds of time these are the 
risk of non communicable diseases we all know those but do we ever thought cancer can be one of the reason for that so as i discussed for in the beginning these are the common questions which relatives come with so in the lifestyle known thing smoking we all know this is the biggest cause uh, but only i would say 20 30% of malignancies do come with the history of smoking uh, in terms of the patients which we say majority you will not find any history of smoking but very very important is second hand smoking very very important uh, i am not smoking but my colleague does i share a cup of tea every afternoon at 4 in my office with him and then at that time there is a smoking zone where he smokes and i sit with him so that is also harmful second hand smoking is as injurious as somebody smoking himself so that should be discouraged also people at home try to uh, do try to smoke in the balcony so that their kids are inside but believe me the you cannot uh, keep them away from the smoke so if at all somebody is smoking please understand that they are not only risking their self they are risking the people around they are risking their families they are risking their friends so i would request everybody to pass on this message this not the only person who is smoking is important it is the people around or also going to get affected so smoking should be discouraged in any form as such then comes alcohol there is a myth that alcohol is not related to malignancy once in a while is okay what everybody sits and chats but if you see the data only alcohol yes it causes gi malignancies if it is combined with smoking it becomes four times so i would not suggest it is safe to go ahead with alcohol consumption one should be careful about it so as i said the digestive cancers esophageal laryngeal then something comes very very important which i think uh is the most important part of this presentation is obesity did we ever believed obesity can be a reason for cancer lifestyle yes smoking other things acceptable how many of us thought that the first cause for somebody getting malignancy can be obesity this is what i wanted to suggest or present obesity is something it's an elephant we are missing in the room the risk associated overweight and obesity is around 40% it is there if you go to any oncologist or any cancer treating uh, physician surgeon opd and just calculate the bmi of all the patient just check the bmi of all the patient who visited that day you will see around 50% of them will have a bmi of more than 25 so you can do a random check anywhere and this is how much this is the data which suggests almost 40% are related to overweight and obesity how to avoid it keep a bmi of 23 to 25 good physical activity diet rich in fruits and antioxidants this is something which in general public can do cancer patients can do to prevent recurrences so this is something which is there in all the guidelines to help each and every person to stay away or keep himself safe from this dreadful disease it is proven that some amount of sedentary lives is related to cancer so those who are having a good physical activity they actually decrease a 5% cancer death for themselves so 30 minute of good aerobic exercise has been proven helpful in preventing this so same thing good physical activity is associated with decrease risk of 
different types of malignancies more so with ovarian breast colon cancer very very important diet so the relatives will come up what should we eat uh, our patient was neither taking any alcohol neither smoking still he got malignancy some will come up that they never had touched onion still they got malignancy so this is something they are like then what should we avoid what more should somebody do there are certain things like we can avoid is processed food added sweeteners so and highly refined grains should be something which is can somebody can avoid and rest uh healthy fruit based vegetable based diet at least one meal should be a fruit based uh, uh rest of the thing should be avoided which are mentioned there is also a common question is there in a drug is there in a drug any drug which can uh, help in preventing cancer like there is a vaccine for cervical so patients with uh, hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer uh, the syndromic patients these patients uh, yes this family of uh, patients who belong to this family of syndrome in those cases only there is a data to use ecosprin or aspirin to prevent uh, malignancy the rest of the population it has not been proven does industrial pollution causes malignancy it is suggested that yes it can be one of the risk factor always better always better to wear a mask i would say most of us most of us in last 3 years must have realized uh, there is a decrease incidence of lrti there is a decrease in uh, increase rate decrease rate of nose congestion decrease incidence of headaches after coming back from work just because we all were using mask so this is very very important i wish everybody continues to wear a mask at least while they are driving through a congested uh, road or a industrial area this is something i'll just touch upon uh, we all know there is ultraviolet radiation and radiation exposures like radon and those who are working in uh, radiation units they are at risk but this this is something very very uh, i would say interesting and uh, mobile phones and cancer there is always a question does it, will it cause brain tumor i have been speaking for hours on phone uh, i am always on earphones i use headphones i constantly hear music i have a profession where i have to be on phone i have been doing work from home for last two years would this excess use of phone cause malignancy this is something very very commonly and frequently asked so to answer to this if all of us uh, remember i remember my ug days when uh, i used to be on phone after 11 for at least till 1:30 2 o'clock and and when i used to uh, end the call probably once the battery is all dead uh, i could send there is a heat around my ear so it used to get warm right uh, so this this probably is because some some amount of heat generation is there these are the radiations which are not ionizing though yes these so our smartphones do emit radiation but these are not ionizing ionizing means they don't shift the electrons from one orbit to other that is these and once they do that if it on that is happening that is going to damage the dna and then it can harm or cause malignancies so the smartphones do emit radiation but these are non ionizing so does that causes malignancy theoretically it doesn't theoretically if you ask somebody it will say it doesn't but if you see this is the pattern of heat generation after using a cell phone and also for cancer uh, the to identify a causative agent for cancer one has to wait at least for 15 20, 15 to 20 year that is a period they call 
to see the history or to label some agent to cause malignancy i think we are into 2022 mobile phones were available to commoners and everybody since somewhere around 20, 2005 2007 maybe 5 years down the line you might come to know so there is presently no data as such there are no publications as such to suggest that this causes malignancy but i would say we should still wait for five more years to conclude on to it but there is something some warning available on phone which suggests they should be limited the use should be limited there is a uh, world called a specific absorption rate that is a heat absorbed by the body so they are suggest minimum use of cell phone so there has to be a reason for it because it will apart from causing malignancy if you see loss of sleep headache fatigue memory loss these are something which are related to overuse of cell phones and also some years back you know the who suggested a caution to use excess of phone whether it is carcinogenic so to conclude on mobile phones still we don't know and we don't have enough data to link mobile use to cancer however i would suggest we should use it cautiously more so uh, we see a lot of children been given mobile phones tablets while they are eating even uh, a one year old a six month old child is uh, shown a mobile phone we will see uh, or a tablet just to show a cartoon running around so that should be discouraged in some way there are other toys which are available and we should wait and definitely use it cautiously if not malignancy there are certain other diseases so the other harms to the body which this gadget is causing so how can you actually use the phone in a safe safer way limit your time on phone use a speaker or a headset or hands free and whenever possible text instead of calling somebody if the if you work can be done on a text it is always better this is a specific absorption rate which we can check on our phones there are certain guidelines which we can check on the country's website where they suggest uh, what should be the specific level and we can check the cell phone accordingly but uh, in our country whether it is uh, printed with all phones it, the data is not available lastly uh, these are certain myths about malignancy which are related to lifestyle so i am uh, mentioning those does artificial sweetener causes malignancy answer is no but i would suggest keep the use at the minimum because there is a risk of uh, overweight and obesity associated so keep it at minimum this is something very very hot topic uh, which uh, i get at least two or three representatives in every three months where they come with alkaline diet or an alkaline water suggestion and they suggest or ask us to prescribe it to the patients giving examples of uh, indian sports persons indian celebrities using alkaline diet and alkaline water to prevent to give have good health and prevent malignancies but i'll uh, it's as simple as that our kidneys are more than sufficient to maintain the ph of body and you don't you cannot or nobody can change the ph by even somebody takes a one uh, cup of salt kidneys are more than sufficient to nullify the effects so drinking alkaline water is not supported in any ways to preventing in malignancy yes if you have bought the machine or if you are buying the bottles you can definitely use them for washing vegetables uh, that can be the best use of them but there is no recommendation that it really helps in preventing any disease or malignancy so that is from my side uh, i would be very happy to take any questions on the off of this topic hi dr pritam dr kesar prashant kesar 
thanks for the wonderful right. talk again you, you really touched upon some of the uh, myths or some of the ideas that people have about uh, cancer i have one question and i'm sure it's going on in lot of people mind is about this hpv vaccine so in yeah. your practice when would you suppose some patient ask when would you recommend uh, the right time to give a vaccine to their daughters and when would it be not advisable what what would be your advice to a patient so 9 years onward 9 years onward and up till 13 years is the recommendation but if yes, somebody has cost 13 years up till 26 years you can vaccinate and it is not only for daughters uh, even for male child they should be vaccinated it has a preventive measures against penile cancer and penile disease so all the girls and boys up till 26 if they have missed the age of 13 they should be vaccinated So, what if somebody has already had a sexual contact or may have HPV vaccines, maybe at the age of fifteen or sixteen? Would you advise uh, going ahead with the vaccine? See, so uh, this scenario is uh, there is no clear guideline on it. But yes, if they suggest if there is a limited sexual contact, which they have not mentioned what is limited, then there is a rule, right? And if there have been no multiple partners. then there is a role of getting vaccinated uh, but if there are multiple uh, sexual contacts and multiple partners then there is no recommendation there is a, then there is a high possibility that already hpv has been uh, the patient has hpv and you can't vaccinate them yeah i guess the important point is one the hpv vaccine is already in the system the vaccine may have a very very limited role in uh, preventing preventing the cancer Uh, the second question i would have is that any any uh, idea of the pesticides uh, and relation of pesticides which use and uh, cancer an artificial yes, colors in food yeah so i i mentioned about artificial sweeteners and uh, yes artificial colors colors, colors, colors yeah same thing i would discourage uh, from using those right you we are not sure they are organic i would discourage from using those to the maximum also uh, i would also discourage people uh, from buying they when they go to the vendors they they tend to buy the most colorful fruits try to buy the ones which are more organic the one which is most greener the one which is the capsicum which is the most beautiful in color is the one which has received maximum pesticides and maximum been pestered with manufactured drugs so try to keep yourself at organic as much as possible which is i would say is not very practical i am saying it but if whatever is feasible you know uh, the uh, the vegetable which is least attractive is would be the best one to taste Uh, that is what i when i whenever i accompany my family that is what i tell them all right and if i may ask you one final question from my side any any thoughts on ayurvedic products and their role in cancer uh, usually our beliefs are ayurvedic medicines are without any side effects but in my practice also i have seen lot of ayurvedic medicines sometimes which people use have a lot of heavy metals uh, any thoughts on that so uh, the only proven uh, uh, i would say uh, natural product which has got good data to prevent or uh, reduce recurrences in cancer patient is been turmeric so haldi which we use very That commonly is at our home uh, is proven at present so I, i i don't think we need to buy that we all have uh, turmeric at our place we don't need to buy a, a 3000 rupees capsule of turmeric for our patients even for our patients they can just add more of haldi to their table and that should be sufficient so that is something beneficial uh, if taken in a limited a limited amount uh, rest uh, i don't see any product as such uh, which can actually prevent uh, malignancy and uh, or uh, help in reducing the side effects or curing disease uh, which is uh, you said it ayurvedic but i would not use the word ayurvedic i would say everything comes from nature uh, a beet a paclitaxel based drug which is from the bark of a tree called taxan so it is also natural so it is only that we sitting in our country have divided uh, the drugs into three forms otherwise it is 
either uh, a herb or it is an allopathic drug which is manufactured in the company so anything which is coming from nature either it is a tablet or a herb it has side effects anything taken in excess is going to harm somebody be it heavy metals if taken in small amount may not but in large amount may definitely but at present there is no data to suggest that you take xyz drug it will prevent any malignancy only turmeric which we all are using so continue that rest there is no data uh covid times uh, i think a lot of people were using these curcumin uh, preparations homeopathic uh, you know 10 drops in 100 ml of water and all of us were consuming i think madam has lost connection yeah any other questions dr yeah. manika on the chat box or i can't see any no no questions here sir uh thank you so much uh, dr preetam for giving an insight into an an eye opening talk thank you so much for this talk and with this i would invite uh, dr heman dugar to give vote of thanks so dr. i'll dr. just i'll just take a sec second for thanking uh, the organizers for giving this opportunity to uh, speak on something which is important for all of us thank you thank you all thank you thank you so much dr bhinta over to you dr hemant i think dr manzar i will give the vote of thanks on his behalf so okay. uh, thank you all the uh, participants for staying throughout the program it's been a very enriching program by all the talk all the speakers of uh, moc i would first like to thank the organizers of amc mainly dr nilima who's the president dr hemant dugar who's the secretary and dr veena wani is a program committee chairman for conceiving such a beautiful program and for the speakers of moc to do justice to all the talks that have been given to them i am sure all the participants really enjoyed the program and have been enlightened by the talks any more questions anybody has they can always contact us through their emails and we would be happy to answer them i would also like to thank our educational partners uh, finovet calagar moc and suburban diagnostics for the same thank you one and all for uh, truly making this event a success Uh, i would want to thank uh, dr kerkar uh, for joining in and doing the value additions thank you so much oh my pleasure my pleasure thank you thank you manzar thank happy you. thank you because i logged out in between so i didn't i don't know what happened thank yes ma'am has anyone thank you so much they have not and thank you from my side because you were a new entrant into the uh, uh, amc program so a uh, well done job thank you so much man for this opportunity thank you so much uh next weekend we are going to be meeting you all for the finovate uh, uh, second part uh 25th of december so please do uh, log in uh, our uh, uh, message will reach you i think tomorrow so uh, please start registering yourself for the fincon part 2